Hey everyone, today we're going to be beginning our lecture on Hinduism. Hinduism is, along with uh, the religion of Zoroastrianism, Hinduism is claimed to be the oldest continuous practice religion uh, in the world and for our purposes is the oldest of these religions from the big five that we call of Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So it is the oldest. Its roots stretch extremely far back, as far back as 3000 uh, BCE, maybe much further, perhaps as far back as 7000 BCE. We really don't know uh, how far it stretches, but its roots, its origins are believed to be the oldest of all of the world religions that we know today. Hinduism is also the third largest religion that we're going to talk about in this course with over 1.2 billion followers and followers that are consistently growing every year uh, in part because of India's population as India is a growing nation, a growing developed nation and that will soon surpass China as the world's largest um, populated country on the globe. 94% uh, of all people who practice the faith of Hinduism live within the Indian subcontinent. And so the Indian subcontinent is modern day Pakistan, modern day India, modern day countries of Nepal, and modern day countries of Bangladesh, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, those are considered the Indian subcontinent. Hindus also found, are also found in surrounding countries within South, uh, Southern Asia. As you can see here from this map here that you'll see Indians as far as Singapore, Indonesia, many of the island nations that dot the Indian Ocean, as well as into the Arabian Peninsula due to uh, migrations and the growing economies there in, this, uh, in the uh, Arabian Peninsula, as well as South Africa. So they do have a significant diaspora, but basically most of Hindus di uh, Hinduism's diaspora, and diaspora is just a fancy term that means, comes from the Greek that means to spread out, to cast out like you would with uh, traditional ways of throwing out seeds to plant seeds, you would cast them out into the ground. Same principle here, but they uh, of a scattering of people or a migration of people. Uh, the significant majority of Hindus have migrated or have been dispersed throughout the former British colonies because India was apart for so many centuries, almost four centuries of its existence a part of the British Empire so significant population of Hindus live in the former British colonies so you can see why South Africa why Australia has significant populations of Indians as well as the United Kingdom and the United States and Canada. Hindus is a part of a larger family, a larger classification of religions that we call Eastern religions, primarily only, you know, not just because of its geography, but also because of its way of, of how it sees the world, its worldview. It's quite different and significantly different culturally and orientationally than those that we label and classify as part of the family of Western religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam. Uh, Hinduism belongs within this family of Eastern religions and that we're, we're going to talk about this uh, part of the semester. Hinduism, Jainism, Sikhism, Buddhism, Shinto, Taoism, Dao, Confucianism. They're part of this same basic family of religions that are independent from Western religions and so thus have developed a different philosophy, cosmology, orientation than that of Christianity. So thus, back to our first lecture where we talked about being aware of our Western biases, it plays a factor here starting in Hinduism as well as we continue 
going forward. Because of this shared um, origins of geography, it's also labeled a Dharmaic religion. In fact, like we will soon discuss when we get to our lecture on Judaism, Hinduism is a mother religion, meaning that it is the roots, the basic roots for other religions that we'll talk about within the Eastern religion family, primarily Jainism, Sikhism, and Buddhism. Those, all of those religions emerge out of Hinduism. And so thus Hinduism is what we classify as a mother religion. And so they also fit within this subgroup of Dharmaic religions. And we'll get more about that. Um, also, Hinduism is very unique. Unlike the majority of the world religions that we will discuss in this course, Hinduism is very complex, more complex than all of the other big religions, perhaps maybe it's equally as complex as Buddhism, and you'll maybe possibly see when we get to that lecture soon, that Hinduism is extremely complex to understand because of a lot of it's because of its origins and how it emerged, but also that Hinduism uh, is not as hierarchical and organized as other religions like we see in the West. It's not very, uh, doesn't have a strong emphasis placed upon creeds, placed upon beliefs. In fact, Hinduism has no creed. Hinduism has no ruling religious body. There is no Pope, there is no Vatican, there are no structures, there's no ministers, there's no churches, so to speak, no council of elders, nothing like that. It, out of all of the religions that we will discuss in this course, Hinduism is the least dogmatic religion that we will discuss. And dogmatic, if you're not sure what that means, dogmatic means uh, an emphasis placed on following certain teachings, maintaining certain beliefs. Hinduism is not that way. It's not built that way. It doesn't have a singularity at any point within its religious traditions, meaning that there's no Bible. There's no singular point of reference that all Hindus can to some extent, can all wrap themselves around and hold to some you know, religious truth. So that's why it's very complicated. It's very complex. It is not a monolith. And so a good example of that is you look within the scriptures themselves of Hindu scriptures and you'll find things like there is one reality and one truth, but it speaks in a various ways. Or another famous Hindu proverb that is often used to describe not only the religion of Hinduism, but sometimes when we talk about a comparative religious study, that all religions are the same, they use this Hindu pro proverb that there are many mount, uh, pathways up to the mountain. Hinduism sees itself that way and embraces all of that kind of ideology. There are many pathways to achieving the goals that religion has. And so because of that acceptance, because of that openness within Hinduism, again, it is the least dogmatic of these religions. Hinduism is a synthesis religion. And we'll talk more about that in meaning. It's a synthesized religion of all various other religious traditions that exist within India. When the British, and even before the British, when the Muslims came to India, so the Muslims started coming and arriving in India as early as the eighth century, maybe a little bit earlier, but in, they came in significant force around the 12th century. Uh, the British would come later around the 1600s, um, but both the British and the uh, Muslims ha developed the term Hinduism. Hinduism is not a native term of the Hindu people. 
is not what they would see their own religion. It's not with how they would classify their own religion. They would classify it now today because over time and over the centuries, they have been conditioned to do so. But what a Hindu sees that they're doing is not Hinduism because it's not a native word. It's what we would call in sociology a second secondary category, meaning that it's an external category that other people labeled and put on the Hindu people and put on their religion. And the British were really the most prominent force of this because they needed to, in, in order to rule this great vast territory of India and Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, they need, it helped them to divide the community along religious lines. And so the British were quite good at dividing and classif classifying people groups. And it was quite easy for them to distinguish those who believe in Buddhism, those who believe in Islam, those who believe in Christianity, those who believe in Judaism. There are, were Jews and there still are Jews living in India today. And so it was easy to classify those groups, but the others was so much harder, so much more difficult to all the other native religious traditions within India. And so thus the term Hinduism itself is an umbrella term. It's a synthesized term. It is a secondary category that we use as scholars to lump in a family of religious traditions into a common characteristics which, unfrankly, the common characteristics of that is that they're not Buddhism, they're not Islam, they're not Christianity, they're not Sikhism, they're not Judaism. So they're this, they're Hinduism. So that's another thing that I wanted to bring up of why the complexities of this religion. Hinduism is an orthopraxy religion. And what do I mean by an orthopraxy religion? is that orthopraxy comes from the Greek word meaning ortho, meaning right, correct, and praxi, meaning practices. Hinduism is emphasis, puts greater emphasis on the right ways of doing ritualization. It's all about ritualizations. That's where it places the heart of its religion, the, the, the distinguishing factors of its religion on how you do the religion, its practices. It is not an orthodoxy religion. Oops, sorry, it went away. It's not an orthodoxy religion. Orthodoxy is the Greek word meaning, again, ortho, right, corrective, and doxy from doxeia meaning teachings or beliefs. A good example would be Christianity is an orthodoxy religion. Islam is to some extent both an orthopraxy and an orthodoxy religion, but more so orthodoxy religion. It's obsessed with having the right beliefs the right belief systems. Again, back to my other point up here. Hinduism is the least dogmatic, so therefore it is not an orthodoxy religion. It's an orthopraxy religion. Again, back to that Hindu proverb, there are many pathways up to the mountain. So its, it's emphasis is on the practices, and that's what we'll get to here today. And as I kind of already mentioned here already, but I wanted to hit that point home again, Hinduism is an invented term. It's not a native term. It's not what Hindu people call their religion. In fact, what they would call their religion is Santana Dharma, or just simply Dharma. They would call their religion Dharma. And so that's why, again, the mother of Dharmaic religions, Hinduism sees what they're doing is not a religious thing, but duty or morality or simply living their life the right way. And so again, it's an invented term and it's this classification term for all. So that's why 
uh, if we get to, when we get to talk about Jainism and we get to talk about Sikhism, that you'll see that many Hindus just simply see what Jains do and what Sikhs do as a part of their religious tradition. Well, when we get to Buddhism, you'll see that many Hindus will kind of incorporate Buddhism as well. They will see what Buddhists do as just being part of Christianity. Or sorry, Hinduism. And since I mentioned Christianity, a lot of Hindus will see elements of Christianity and see Christians there in India as they're just doing another form of Hinduism. So it makes it extremely complicated and very um, problematic for us to talk about this religious tradition. But it makes it so fascinating and why we should really study this great world religion. So the next thing that I want to talk about is its origins. Those were just some basic facts. And so I'll begin every lecture talking about some basic facts about every religion. But now let's talk about the origins of this religion. What are the origins of Hinduism? Well, the truth is, is that unlike many of the world religions that we will discuss in this course, the origins of Hinduism are largely still uncertain. We have very good ideas. We have very good theories. We have very good evidences uh, within the field of religious studies, sociology, anthropology, history, basic Indian history as well. We have an idea but we, we really don't have anything of certain. And so thus, Hinduism is not like the many other religions that we will talk about in this course. In fact, it, uh, outside of Zoroastrianism, to some extent, Hinduism is going to stand alone in this course. Well, I'll take the back. I forgot about Shinto. We'll talk when we talk about Shinto. Hinduism will fit a lot along the lines of Hinduism. Our Shinto, Hinduism and Shinto will sound a lot of like because they these two religions and for Hinduism, Hinduism is not a founder's religion, meaning we do not know who founded the religion and has no claim of a founder. Instead, what anthropologists and religious scholars would say is Hinduism is very much an indigenous religion. And so what do I mean by a founder's religion? So I think that's pretty self-explanatory, but I just want to mention it very briefly because we're going to, you're going to see this definition a lot in this course. But a founder religion is a religion in which the origins, the origins and the roots of its beliefs and practices are related to an individual or individuals, depending on which religion we're talking about, teachings. So a founder religion has a founder. Hinduism is not that. Hinduism is a, an indigenous religion. And what do we mean by indigenous religions? Indigenous religions refer to an ancestral religion of a people group who are native to a particular area or landscape, so native to India, the Indian subcontinent here, and apply localized belief systems and that usually do not engage in proselytization and whose beliefs are orally transmitted and are intertwined with their traditional lifestyles. That's ind indigenous religions. So it's native. It's native to a particular geographical region. So the Indian subcontinent. It maintains very localized belief systems, belief systems that you won't see elsewhere throughout the world. You won't see, um, uh, well, that's a little bit of a misnomer, but there are some characteristics that we see elsewhere. But again, belief practices that are not seen elsewhere. It's again, very localized to this region. And that they don't engage in proselytization, which is very true about Indian culture. 
outside of the new religious movements of the Hare Krishnas, Hinduism doesn't have a, and its history has never cultivated a missionary aspect of their faith. People typically don't convert to Hinduism. They're born into it. It's part of their ethnicity. It's part of their culture. And in fact, there's really no practices, ritualizations for conversion like there is with Christianity, uh, a baptism, or is in Islam, or as in Judaism to some extent. Judaism really doesn't have, but it, it makes do with some kind of proselytizing uh, aspect and ritualization as well. Buddhism has those rituals as well of, say, of, of a belief system of the three jewels. Hinduism doesn't have that. It's very much an indigenous religion. And so what we mean by indigenous religions, typically we, you know, when we say that word, we think of the Native Americans. We think of, uh, you know, uh, tribes in the Amazon River Basin, or we think of tribes out in the Pacific Islands. No, rather think of indigenous religions as the ancient Greek religion or the ancient Egyptian religion that we know so well from our Western Civ studies. Think of that. This is what we mean by an indigenous religion, that it's very localized and emerges in very much a part of its culture. So where do scholars think that the origins of Hinduism really began? Well, many scholars and historians advocate for what is known as the Aryan invasion theory. So first, I need to talk about that word, Aryan. Now, probably many of you, your ears popped up as soon as I said Aryan. And the reason for that is we think the Nazis. We think the Nazis of World War II. We think the Nazis of Adolf Hitler, the goose step in swastika wearing, uh, you know, that always fought Indiana Jones and that were uh, the bad guys and in inglorious bastards. Aryan, that term Aryan was co-opted by the Nazis. So we're not talking about Nazis, Nazis invading India. So I want to make that clear. Uh, Aryanism, uh, we're not talking about that either here. This refers to a specific group of people, the Aryans, that's a theorized group of people, the Aryans, who lived in the area of Central Asia, on the high step plains of Central Asia, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, parts of Turkey, parts of Uzbekistan, this area of Asians that is believed to have been the source of many of, of Europe's population from back in the olden days. And so that's the word Aryan that's being used here. So again, don't think Nazis. This is not Nazis here. Um, however, Hitler and the Nazis co-opted many of these theories because it fit their narrative. So the Aryan, so the first, the Aryan invasion theory was first proposed in the 19th centuries by European uh, linguists, linguists or scholars who studied languages. Uh, but European uh, linguists that began to notice when they first started to encounter because of the growth of the British Empire and of British trade in Europe, there began a great interest in many of the cultures that the British Empire had succumbed. And so we started seeing texts and religious traditions being brought out of India and into Europe for the first time in, in centuries. And scholars, these scholars started taking a great interest in them, started reading these texts and studying these texts. And these linguistics and cultural uh, uh, scholars started to notice unmistakable similarities between the language of the ancient people of India, the language of Sanskrit, and their own, their own European native tongues. They started seeing these cultural similarities and religious similarities with the people groups of this ancient area of India 
and their own ancestors that we knew of Norse religion, of the Greek religion, of the Roman religion, of the Celtic religion, we started seeing unmistakable parallels. And so many scholars like the famed Max Mueller that we talked about earlier uh, in the course so far, noted that various words within Sanskrit, the ancient languages of the religious texts of the Hindu religion, the Vedas that we'll talk about here in a few seconds, had significant similarities with all the other European languages. And so he noticed these characteristics and thought, huh, this just isn't a coincidence that they are related. There has to be some correlation. Why does the word for soul in Sanskrit, Atman, is the exact same word for soul in German, in ancient German, Proto-German? Why is it the exact same word with the exact same pronunciation? And there were many, many, many other words just like that as well. It's not a coincidence. And Max Mueller also noticed that many of the characteristics of the gods and the stories of the Vedas parallel almost to a T the stories of the ancient Greeks, the Norse people, the ancient Persian religions, again, almost to a T. So this began to lead uh, an idea among these scholars of the 19th century that they started to propose a common ancestral people between ancient Europe and ancient India. A common ancestral language between these two groups known as the Indo-European language. And Max Mueller and many of these scholars were quite correct that, for example, the language today of modern day uh, Iran, Farsi, the modern day language of Iran, Farsi, has significant cognates, significant uh, language structures and parallels to that of French. That if you're a native French speaker, it won't take you very long to start picking up and how to speak Farsi. Certain dialect differences, certain influences of Arabic culture and things like that, but there are some basic roots that you can easily pick up. The same thing between uh, British people. Why people who speak English can pick up German quite fast because English is a part of the Germanic languages. They can pick it up quite fast. And I can testify to that. When I started studying German for my doctorate's work, I was able to pick it up quite fast because there's significant parallels. The rules of German work exactly the same as that of English. And so, People propose that these, this is what explains the, the emergence of, or these, explains these parallels, is that there must have been one people group who emerged in the same region, but then had dispersed and migrated. Some of them migrated into Europe, the rest migrated into India to explain these original roots. And so this became known as the Aryan theory. But the invasion part, speaks to other key of things and key events that happen within the culture. So the theory gained further and further support as uh, archaeologists and historians and anthropologists started to uncover more and more territory. So the first of the big evidence came uh, between the years 1829 and 1842 when the British explorer and spy or intelligence officer Charles Masson, um, and Masson spelled M-A-S-S-O-N, Masson, discovered ruins of ancient cities throughout the Indus River Valley. Uh, these ancient cities were later identified, as you can see here on the map. And so uh, Masson first believed that these were ancient cities that were built and left over from the Greek uh, invasion of Alexander the Great, that they had invade, you know, Alexander the Great famously invaded India uh, in around the year 327, 327 BC, maybe 325 BC, that he had invaded India between those two time periods. And so some of these uh, 
ruins were leftovers of the Alexandrian period because they were quite massive, quite impressive, quite structured, quite uh, um, laid out in planned organizational style. So thus the Greeks brought part of their culture down to India. However, it quickly became realized that this, these ancient cities, these ancient ruins, <laughs> don't date back to the Greek period. And in fact, date much later, significantly later, as late as 33,000, or 3300, sorry, 3300 BCE. So the time of the ancient Egyptians, when they were building, first starting to build the pyramids, these civilizations were already at their peak. And so it became realized, uh, particularly with the help in 1904 of John Marshall, that we're looking at an independent civilization that existed in India that was to rival that of ancient Egypt, of ancient Babylon, and we found trade evidence of this group. And so this, this, this area became known as the Harappan civilization, or better known, and I like to use this term as well, the Indus River Valley civilization, or the IVC for short. And as you can see here on the map, a huge territory that ran uh, within the valley between the, the two mountainous regions, as well as the plains, the rest of the lower plains of, of India, but similarly, but mostly around the Indus River. This civilization was quite impressive. As you can see here, uh, this is a map of Harappan. Uh, it's a very impressive city, a large city. Uh, archaeologists have speculated that this city held over 40,000 citizens. Just one city alone, 40,000 citizens. And so it was a very impressive, it was a play, you, uh, you can look at the structure there, it's very planned, very organized with uh, simple structured buildings, um, clear walkway pathways, impressive arc, uh, um, aqueducts that collect water and return water, you know, they kept water for this very um, significant area. So a very impressive period. But um, the problem with this great civilization is that we found all of this epigraphical evidence. So these are texts written on um, pieces of pottery or texts written on um, broken, you know, pieces of wall or clay tablets, things like that, not on writing materials, but, you know, structural writing materials that we found. We found the language of this people group, but we can't translate it. We don't have a key. So it's this lost civilization that we don't know anything, we don't really know concrete evidence about. We know some great deal, uh, great deals about this culture, but we don't have hard, significant evidence. We don't have written texts where we know what the day and day life of this culture was, what in fact they actually believed. Who were they? How did they self-identify themselves like we have of the ancient Persians or the ancient Babylonians or the ancient Egyptians? We know all of these questions because we can read their language. For this culture, the Indus River Valley culture, we can't read the language. We have the text, but we can't read it yet. So we don't understand it. We have no idea. But what we can gather from the evidence is that this is a culture that was significantly different than what we see within the religious texts and the things that we do have of the early Hindu people, the early Indian people who used this language of the Vedas, who spoke in Sanskrit. We see no parallels, no significant parallels between the two cultures. And so thus, it was proposed as an explanation of what happened to this civilization, because the civilization starting around the year uh, 1500 BCE, we see the, the decline of the Indus River Valley civilization. And that by the 1300s, the civilization had disappeared altogether. It ceased to exist, it ceased to be thriving. So what happened? Well, the theory was is that an invasion took place as an explanation of why this culture rapidly disappeared and its language never survived. 
its religious traditions never survived is because it was replaced by another group of people who spoke a completely different language, who had a completely different religious tradition. The second greatest piece of evidence actually comes from the Vedas themselves. The, the term that is used within the Vedas to refer to the, the culture of their own people who spoke the language and who uh, revered the scriptures of the Vedas, the Vedas called their people Arya, the Arya, which again, you, later Europeans grabbed on and used as a term for Aryans. And the Vedas themselves would talk about other people who weren't like them, who were outsiders to their community and to their culture and that who they had done battle with and who had they had conquered and who were known as an Arya, meaning non Aryans. So we also see this exact same two terms, Arya, being used in ancient Persia as well. So Persia, the modern day country of Iran and Afga parts of Afghanistan and parts of Pakistan, that's the ancient area of Persia. They're not too far from where we're talking about in India, just over the mountain ranges. They have, the ancient Persians, use the exact same term, the Aryans, to describe themselves. And that when you read their ancient, very ancient religious manuscripts, they have significant parallels, almost exact parallels, to many of the practices put out in the Vedas. So it was theorized that it's these people who came from ancient Persia who invaded further and further south and soon replaced the in this River Valley situation, civilization. Um, and it's only here recently that the evidence for an, an Aryan invasion took some more roots and, and grew some more legs with that of DNA. DNA tests being done between two people groups, between those who have traditionally lived in the northern areas of the Indian subcontinent versus those who live in the south. There are significant differences, ethnically, DNA-wise, significant differences. And if you ever have the chance to go to India, you can see the differences yourselves. The people who have existed primarily in the northern areas of India typically have a lighter skin tone versus than those who live in the South, who have a much darker skin tone. And so, DNA, so historians and, and scientists did DNA tests to understand why these two significant differences within their cultures. And it turned out that people in the North, their DNA matched more so with those from ancient Persia, from the areas of Pakistan, Afghanistan, modern day Iran, Iraq, Central Asia, the high steppes of Uzbekistan as well, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, all of those. They had significant parallels. Then they did DNA tests on those within Southern India and found their DNA had little traces, very little traces of those from Persia, but they were more so related to those who are the Aborigines who live in the continent of, of um, the continent island of Australia. So again, it seems to point to some differences. So it gave evidence to and this invasion theory. However, today, there's hardly any scholar in the world or historian of Indian culture or of Hinduism would hold to the Aryan invasion theory. Uh, but it's still taught, unfortunately, because we don't have a better explanation. Well, I shouldn't say that. I'm not going to say that we don't have a better explanation. We do have a better explanation, but it's still primarily taught uh, in textbooks. And so that's why I want to mention it here, because probably uh, the textbook you're using right now is also going to talk about the Aryan invasion theory. It's the most dominant theory out there, and it's been what was taught for, for over 100 years. Of as an explanation for 
Hinduism. But however, again, most scholars don't hold to this theory anymore. Um, and one of the main criticisms of the Aryan invasion theory is really the lack of archaeological evidence to support an invasion. Although some scholars point to similarities in pottery and artifacts found in India versus Central Asia that say, see here, there are similarities. There's really no clear evidence of any large scale migration of people from Central Asia to India. There is some, but it's not significant to talk about an invasion that happened. Furthermore, there's no archaeological evidence of a military or violent incursion at all. Because you can look at the ruins here. The ruins are pretty much left intact. They were just simply abandoned. And the archaeological evidence supports that, that these ruins were just abandoned. These cities were just abandoned and then succumbed to ruin. And what the archaeological evidence actually supports is that environmental causes led to the downfall of the Indus River Valley situation, meaning that probably the Indus River Valley significantly dried up at a period of time. That the temperatures probably were much different. The climate was significantly different because of the mountain ranges. They probably had uh, more snow impact in the area that melted every summer to give fresh food and, and, and to uh, you know, put nitrogen back into the land in order to grow crops, the, the, the area significantly changed and became more of a dry and desert region instead, leading for people to abandon and move further and further south, which again, the DNA evidence kind of points to that too, that there is some evidence. You don't see it going too much the other way around, southern DNA into the north, but you do see northern DNA into people in the south. Another significant piece of evidence and criticism about the Aryan theory is that many critics argue it's really based on racism or a European, a, a kind of a European bias or a Eurocentro biases. And the reason for, for that is that they point out this theory was developed by Europeans, white European scholars during the colonial period of time when the British Empire and other European countries were colonizing these areas. And so to point out, they use this theory to point out the superiority of the European civilization. And the Aryan theory was quickly adopted by the British colonial government in India and was used significantly and repeatedly to justify British rule over India. To see that the original fathers of the Vedas were Europeans. So the theory suggested that the British were descendants of the Aryans and that therefore they were the natural rulers of India, and that the native population, which was pri primarily of uh, Derivian stock, and that's again the southern area of India, were inferior to British rule. So again, this is why a lot of people have abandoned this theory. And really the truth is that the greater um, sense of evidence points to not so much an invasion but a change of culture, a migration, as more people from Persia slowly moved and trickled down further and further into India and into the subcontinent that the cultures change. Or we just simply don't have the archaeological evidence of the civilizations from the central part of India. We don't. We have a lot from the north, a lot from the south, but not the central part of India. Um, that there might have been hidden cultures that were there that influenced and that actually were what the, the, the Vedas had emerged from. We simply just don't have enough information. So what we do know, and today um, what we have proposed is instead is that Hinduism is really a synthesis of various religion traditions that had once dominated the Indian subcontinent. And so we can get that kind of evidence quite clear. 
from the Indus River Valley uh, civilization, we see they did practice fire sacrifices. They did practice um, yoga meditations. We have that evidence from epigraphical depictions of their gods. From the southern cultures that we do see, they were great builders of temples. And so we have this blending, what scholars think is a blending known as the uh, Vedic synthesization that emerged of when the Vedas emerged and possibly were brought down from Persia that is synthesized and emerged together with other Indian traditions to produce a native religion that we call today classical Hinduism. And so for the rest of this lecture, that's what I'm going to be talking about today, classical Hinduism. I'm not going to be talking about the Hinduism of the ancient Vedas. That's a different lecture, a different time period if we have them. I'm not going to talk about modern Hinduism as how it's evolved into this, uh, to something that's a little bit different. We're going to be talking about classical forms of Hinduism today for our lecture um, in this class. So that leads us to our next topic. What is Hinduism? Well, as I said, Hinduism is known as Santana Dharma, which in the Sanskrit means the internal truth. And that's how they describe their own religion. They describe it as the truth, this eternal truth that teaches that all of life is consumed by samsara. And we'll talk about what is samsara. And that the goal of human, of human life, its real purpose, its existence in the cycle of samsara is to be done with life, to break the cycle of samsara. And so that is really the definition of Hinduism. Definition of Hinduism is a diverse religion of India that teaches that life is consumed by samsara and humanity's real purpose is to be done with life forever. And we'll talk more about that here in a minute. As kind of stated before, and I'm going to hit hard, uh, hit, um, hit this point even harder here, because of its complexity, Hinduism is easily, easily misunderstood and often misunderstood. It gets quite, it gets labeled quite easily and quite often as, oh, just a simple polytheistic religion. And so if you remember from our first lecture, a polytheistic religion comes from the Greek word poly, meaning many, and theos, meaning God, so many gods, is a belief system that there are many gods and goddesses that existed who interfere and interact with human uh, endeavors and human history, uh, and who also have somewhat human-like characteristics. And so Hinduism often gets labeled, oh, they believe in so many gods, and that is kind of true. In fact, Hinduism has around um, 330,000, yeah, no, sorry, 33,000 different deities. See, Hinduism is a polytheistic religion. It's a little more complicated than that. And so while it's true, that statement is really false. It's not a polytheistic religion. The truth is, is that Hinduism is a panatheistic religion. Panathea comes from the Greek word pan, meaning all. In, E-N, is the preposition, the English preposition, in, I-N, all in God, or God is in all. Now, it's not to be confused with pantheistic, which is very similar, God is all, but no, God is in all. So the difference is, Hinduism is, believes in pantheist, pantheistic, which implies that the divine is greater than the universe. God is in all, not the universe is God, God is all, but God is in all of the universe, the created world that the God had created. And so it means that all of these different religions, or I mean, excuse me, all of these different gods within the religion 
are part of pervasive one, deity and truth. Hindus believe in Brahma, Brahma, B -A, or B -R -A -H -M -A. so emphasis on M-A-N here. Brahman, because you're also going to hear Brahmin and Brahma within Hinduism. So this is very important to note. And just as a side note here, learning a religion is like learning a language, a different language. And so like learning a different language, the details matter. And so therefore, you're going to learn a lot of these terms here. And so in Hinduism, it's going to be kind of confusing because, again, what's the difference between Brahman with the A-N versus Brahman with an I-N or just Brahma without an N? So, you know, just an A without an N. There's significance here. So this is Brahman, B-R-A-H-M-A-N, Brahma. Hindus believe that this is God. And that Brahman is both many and one. Brahman is an impersonal, all-pervasing spirit. It is the universe, but yet transcends the universe. It is space and time, but yet transcends it as well. Brahman within Hinduism is the ultimate reality. It's what we have. And so uh, a famous quote from the Upanishads, one of the religious texts within uh, Hinduism describes Brahman as, quote, in the beginning, this world was Brahman, the limitless one. Limitless in, to the east, limitless to the north, limitless to the west, limitless to the south, limitless in every direction. He who is incomprehensible, he who is unborn, he who is unthinkable, he who has soul and who is space. Brahman is, per, again, pervasive. It's pervasive through everything and is everything. It is the manifestation of everything. Everything is Brahma. So, while Hinduism might have many gods like Shiva, Vishnu, Ganesh, uh, Lakshmi, Kali, things that we'll talk about here towards the end of the course, even though they're all of these independent gods with these different looks and different characteristics and different positions that are very important to know and look. But again, back to the complexity of Hinduism, they are all still the same god. So again, it's, it's, it's true to describe Hindu, uh, Hinduism as a polytheistic religion. It's also false because of its complexity, that it's more, at times it feels more monotheistic. At times it's gonna feel more henotheistic. But that's why we say instead that it's a pan, panotheistic religion. All. God is in all things. So he's pervasive. He's in everything. So again, Hinduism has this weird complexity to it. But I must stress, there is no contradiction in that complexity. There is no error within that complexity. A Hindu is free to worship as many gods and goddesses as they want because, again, all of these goddesses and gods are still manifestations of the one, Brahma. Each deity is the embodiment of Brahman beyond just a representation of it. So again, <laughs> this is why Hinduism is so complex. But I think it's very easy to understand at the same time. Everything is Brahma. And so how Brahma is understood, Hinduism stresses that Brahman is ineffable, ineffable, that it cannot be described in words 
but yet it can be experienced. And it's experienced directly through various pathways within Hinduism. And that the goal is to connect ourselves, to reconnect ourselves with the truth about who we are, about our existence. That if everything is Brahman and Brahma is in everything, that means he's within us. That humanity is Brahman as well, part of the Brahman. So in one instance, Hindus would believe we ourselves are gods. And so that's why some Hindus would say, <laughs> you know, you could almost argue that they're atheistic because they don't believe in any other gods except themselves. So that's again why the beauty of Hinduism, it's very complex, but there's no contradictions. There's no error in what they believe. It embraces the complexity. So it can be experienced and it's experienced through the pathways, but specifically for our purposes here in our lecture, we're going to talk about three specific pathways that you can understand and experience Brahma. And they're known as the Trigmarga or the three paths. And what are those three paths? The three paths are karma marga. Sometimes you'll see karma yoga as well, because yoga also means path. So depending on different spellings, but for us, you'll, you might hear me use both terms, karma yoga, karma marga, but I'm talking about the same thing. But for, I'm gonna try to be consistent here and to use only marga because of the trig marga to help you remember it. But um, so there's karma, uh, karma marga, there's also yana marga, and then bhakti marga that we'll talk about. But the trick marga aims to put these practices, to use these practices in place, and they're designed, the whole goal of all of these three paths are interconnected and interrelated. They operate, they go along different routes. But at the end, they all lead up to the mountain. And what is the mountain point? The mountain point is the purpose. And the purpose is to look inward and to discern the true nature, as already mentioned. The true nature about ourselves and the true nature about our relationship to the universe and to, the, to existence. We are part of Brahma. And that the aim of these paths is to break the cycle, the cycle of samsara, and thus to achieve moksha. And so we'll talk about what are these two terms here in just a minute. So we're going to be talking about our, uh, before we dive into what is samsara, what is moksha, things like that, I think now is a good time to pause and transition just a little bit to talk about uh, the Hindu religious text. And so that's what we're going to talk about with our next uh, bit of slides here. So the religious texts of Hinduism, like many of the world religions uh, that we will discuss in this course, Hinduism is a revealed religion. Um, a revealed religion is one based on information communicated from a spirit, from the spiritual world to humanity, whether through an angel or through a divine being itself, um, or some sort of medium, basically, uh, to a prophet or to a religious scribe who thus then composes a religious text. But one of the reasons as to why Hinduism is a synthesis and a mixture of various religious uh, traditions in India is that it has no authoritative singular set of scriptures that dictates to what all Hindus believe, meaning there is no Bible. There's no Quran that operates that way within those religious traditions. Again, Hinduism has no creed. 
It has no religious central figures, no hierarchy. There is no singular text, but Hinduism does recognize um, it does recognize a classification of Hindu scriptures, which in some are given preferences over others. And because of this classification, scholars can speak of a Hindu canon of scriptures so that they do operate as authoritative texts. But again, I have to emphasize there's no singular authoritative texts. There are authoritative texts, plural, several different ones. Um, but very, very quickly, I want to remind us what the term canon means. Canon, C-A-N-O-N, -N, not canon like a like a, uh, a gun, like on a deck of a ship or a big, massive piece of artillery. No, canon is C-A-N-O-N. -N. Canon comes from the Greek word meaning a ruler or a certain standard of measurement, and it refers to a set of texts, either singular or plural, that a particular religious community regard as authoritative for religious belief and practices. So for example, within Christianity, the Bible is the canon of scriptures, those that are authoritative. The Quran is a canon within Islam, those that are seen as authoritative. Those that are labeled as non-canonical means the opposite, that the majority of religious communities do not accept or consider these set of, set of texts as authoritative, but maybe perhaps a small majority do. So canon versus non-canonical, these are going to be the canonical texts of the Hindu scriptures. Um, but there are various classifications. And so the first of these classifications is that the ancient Hindu scriptures themselves have to be written in ancient Sanskrit. Now, Sanskrit is the ancient classical language of South Asia and is part of the Indo-European family of languages. Sanskrit did not originate in India, so this leads to the Aryan theory as we talked about but rather as part of the migration of Aryans to India. So around 2000 BCE to around 1400 BCE, we start to see the emergence of this language appearing on the Indian subcontinent. And while Sanskrit is no longer an active spoken language or the first language of the Indian people today, it is still being preserved consistently by the religious elites, priests, or academic scholars. Second is that the ancient Hindu scriptures are classified into these two broad categories, the Shurti and the Smrti. The Shurti refer to those texts which are regarded as, quote, not made by the hands of men meaning that they weren't composed by men themselves, but instead they believe within Hindu traditions that they were revealed by the deities, by gods or intermediaries between the gods and humans. And so they're revealed texts. And so within Hindu traditions, they were, they're believed to be have revealed to the rishis or the seers, meaning that which is heard. The Shirti are generally regarded as authorless, meaning that they don't have a, a singular human or author, but instead have been orally transmitted by the gods to humanity and have been carried out throughout the centuries. And so thus they have the highest level of authority within the religious tradition of Hinduism. So for example, uh, the corpus of the four Vedas are seen as Shurti. The Upanishads are seen as Shurti. So those are just a few examples. So there's Shurti and now Smrti, which refers to those texts that are regarded as man-made, meaning that they have been handwritten by humans and do have a traditional author. Shurti uh, is usually translated as that which is 
remembered versus that which is heard. That which is remembered. They do have an author. Um, so examples of these corpus would be many of the great Hindu epics like the Bhagavad Gita as the Mahabharata or the uh, Ramayana, the Puranas that we'll also talk about as well, various sutras written by great, the great philosophers or yogis of the tradition. However, the most important of the Hindu scriptures are the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, the Ramayana, and the laws of Manu. So the first that we're gonna talk about is the Vedas. They are the most important. The Vedas are a large collection of religious texts written in Vedic Sanskrit and represent the oldest written layer of religious and literary text in India. Uh, the Vedas are believed to have been uh, originally composed orally sometime around the year 1900 BCE, maybe even further back. And however, scholars believe that they were, had begun to be start to, to be written down around the year 1200 BCE to about 900 BCE, depending on who you ask. Uh, and, but they do show evidence of being significantly redacted meaning that they had later editors who cleaned up the texts and the manual manuscripts and the tradition is okay with that whereas within christianity or judaism they don't like to accept the idea that their scriptures were later redacted um, by editors within hinduism it's quite okay uh and also what's significant about the vedas which again lends to that Aryan invasion theory or Aryan migration theory that we talked about a few moments ago is that the composition of the Vedas, of the text, when it talks about some of the landscape or geographical regions of India within the text, it's specifically, and much of the events that happened, specifically happened within the north, northeast section of India. So again, leads to that belief of some kind of theory about the Vedas and about the origins of the Vedas. Uh, the Vedas are an umbrella term which can incorporate other religious texts. So that's why the Vedas are seen as the most authoritative of all because they can incorporate many much more uh, manuscripts and religious traditions that have been deemed as Shakti. But generally the Vedas refer to four primary texts that make up the collection known as the Vedas. And so the first and greatest of the Vedas is the Rig Veda. The Rig Veda, R-I-G-V-E-D-A. The Rig Veda. The Rig Veda is the oldest of the Vedic literature and is translated to mean praise knowledge. That's what Rig Veda means. Uh, the Rig Veda consists primarily of hymns dedicated to the various gods of the old Vedic religion, which are somewhat different than the, the gods that we see of the classical Hinduism that we'll talk about later in this uh, lecture. But they consist primarily of hymns, some commentary, discussion about rituals and sacrifice, and they contain a significant book, the Upanishads, which we'll talk about later. Second is the uh, Yarur Veda, Yaru Veda, Y A J U R, uh, and Veda V E D A, uh, which means worship knowledge and is a comp uh, compilation of ritual offering formulas that are to be said from memory by the priests when they're performing the ritual actions of the old Vedic religion, and more specifically. Uh, the action that is most common to these the priests that they would do is known as the yana fires, the yana fires, or the yana sacrifices. And so yana refers to a Hindu uh, libation ritual performed before uh, a built fire and presided over a priest. Within Hinduism, the priest is known as Brahmin. And so this brings you back to our earlier discussion about you need to know the difference between Brahman, 
B R A H M A N. That's the universal God. And Brahmin are the priests, are the priests within the Hindu Old Vedic tradition. So Brahmin is B R A H M I N. And so the Brahmin would offer sacrifices to the ancient Vedic god of Hinduism, Agni. Agni, who is the messenger god and the god of fire, and who would messenger between humanity and the gods in the cosmos. So that is the Yaru, or Yaru Veda. And so the next is Sama Veda, which refers to song knowledge and consists of various songs, melodies, and mantras that were to be sung or chanted during Hindu rituals. Again, priests would primarily do this, and they would actually do this from memory. They wouldn't read the text straight out. Some might today, but typically most Brahmins do it from memory. Uh, and the last of the Vedas are the Athrava Veda. Named after the Vedic sage Atharva, who is believed to have been the original hearer or person who heard the Vedas from the divine and who started the oral transmission of the Vedas. Uh, and so this is kind of consists of formulas uh, for more rituals um, and some particular rules for daily life of the Hindus as well as its leadership of how the royal court is supposed to function. Overall, uh, the Vedas are considered to contain orthodox teachings and beliefs of Hinduism known as Ashtika. Ashtika is the orthodox teachings and beliefs of Hinduism and uh, that they are being consistently recited throughout the cosmos and um, that they are of kind of divine origin. The Vedas are generally learned and recited only by the religious elites within India. So meaning that the average Hindu person actually does not read the Vedas and probably doesn't own the Vedas. Many modernists, uh, yeah, many modernists in India uh, actually reject the Vedas. They consider what the Vedas had taught and teach as uh, anti, anti-modern. Well, well, in truth, they would call it actually unorthodox or Gnostica, Gnostica. So they're not Astica, orthodox, they're Gnostica, unorthodox, non-orthodox teachings. And so there is a movement of within Hinduism to completely reject the Vedas. Because it's true that if you actually read the Vedas, much of the practices and traditions of the Veda are completely different than what we consider classical Hinduism. They, in fact, speak to an older form of Hinduism that was done and practiced within India that we call the old Vedic religion. Uh, that if we were doing a typical class on Hinduism, we would spend much time. But for our purposes, we're only going to focus on classical forms of Hinduism. The next significant uh, piece of literature within the Hindu tradition is known as the Upanishads. The Upanishads refer to a collection of Hindu philosophical texts and dialogues written uh, around 800 BCE to maybe as, uh, uh, as early as 300 BCE. Um, so they're kind of a much newer text, and the Upanishads are commonly referred to within Hinduism as Venata. Venata, which means the last chapters of the Veda. And so they are seen as extremely authoritative and some kind, sometimes seen as a commentary on the Vedas themselves. So while the hymns of the Vedas emphasize um, uh, uh, ritualizations, the aim of the Upanishads is to investigate the nature of the Atman, the self, and to direct oneself towards religious inquiry. 
to discover the true self. So it's very different from the Vedas. The Vedas are you know, hymns to the greatnesses of the gods, formulaic sayings and songs that are to be sung. The Upanishads are written directly to the people. So the spirit of the Upanishads, to some extent, is inherently opposed to the ritualizations of the Vedas. And so that's why most um, see the Upanishads as the greatest representation of Hinduism and is what we'll be focused on primarily um, with classical Hinduism. The old Upanishads actually launch attacks of increasing intensity on the nature of ritualizations as being a problem. Anyone who worshipped the divinity in the old way was seen as a domesticated animal, really, is the type of language that they would use. So the Upanishads, even though they're seen as the last chapters of the Vedas, they kind of represent a significant shift within the culture. The Upanishads, the authors of the Upanishad argues that the external ritualizations that were proposed by the Vedas actually need to be replaced and be replaced with inner ritualizations. Ritualizations of introspection, as I'd like to say it. Um, that the pursuit isn't, you know, to pacify the gods or to maintain the Rita, uh, this uh, cosmic maintenance, as I like to refer to it, as uh, within the old Vedic religion, but instead that the ritual is a, that the goal of life is knowledge and pursuit of that original truth. So the Upanishads are very much a a um, uh, a philosophical endeavor that the rituals for the Upanishads are a bunch of blind men leading other blind men as they would describe it but it uses ritualizations though and this is why again it's known as the last chapters of the Vedas is because the Upanishads consistently use the Vedas and the ritualizations taught by the Vedas but argue that instead they should be seen as allegorical lessons, allegorical truths. And so that's something that's very different. And the Upanishads argue that the universe doesn't consist of us, this binary system of just us and the gods, and that we need to placate the gods in order to maintain prosperity. But rather the simple is even um, uh, simplified even further. Just this simple binary of what is real, Atman, and what is false, Maya, Maya, M-A-Y-A, Maya. It is the Upanishads that see the Hindu that see these Hindu terms like Atman, Maya, concepts of Dharma, Karma, Samsara, Moksha. They're found here in the Upanishads. They're not found in the Vedas. So therefore, the Upanishads are the foundational texts and lay at the heart of many of the Hindu traditions, but more specifically at the heart of the second path, the Yana Marga, Yana Yoga traditions that we'll talk about here in a little bit. But that is the Upanishads. The next significant text is probably the greatest and the most popular of all Hindu texts. It is the Bhagavad Gita, or sometimes simply just known as the Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is a 700 verse Hindu text that lies within another Hindu text. That's a part of the great Hindu epic, the Mahabharata and is one of Hinduism's best known and celebrated and beloved texts of all. The Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, talked about the Bhagavad Gita in terms of, in comparisons within Christianity as it is the Hindu gospel text. So think of it in that terms, if it helps. The Mahabharata, is a massive 
very big, massive literary epic, over 200,000 verses. So six times the size of the Bible. And basically what this massive epic does is it narrates a, a struggle between two family groups, two cousins within the uh, Kurakshukta War, which is this mythical war that's very similar within Greek cultures to that of the Trojan War. And so think of the Mahabharata as similar to Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, epic texts within the traditions and cultures of the Greek culture. This is a very epic text where it talks about two families fighting each other for power and for succession. But it also contains philosophical and devotional materials. And so the Bhagavad Gita is one of those. And the Bhagavad Gita is a small part of this epic. And it consists primarily of a dialogue between the Paravana prince and hero of the story, Arjuna, and his charioteer, Krishna who we'll talk about later, Krishna is one of the avatars of the Hindu god Vishnu. So the story of the Bhagavad Gita goes that Arjuna is filled with despair and faces a great moral dilemma about the violence and death that this huge, massive war was causing, not only on his people, and on his, but on his family. And that the violence and death from the war is just too great. Just too great to compliment. And so he's, he's kind of having a midlife crisis. So Arjuna then wonders if he should just renounce the battle and, and renounce his titles because he doesn't want to kill his own family. He doesn't want to kill his cousins. What, over power? Over a simple title? And so he begins to seek out advice from his charioteer, who he doesn't know is the Hindu god, Krishna. And so Krishna begins to give him advices and answers. And so it's that di the, 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 this, the discourse, the dialogue between the two is what constitutes the bulk of the Gita. And so Krishna counsels Arjuna, the, the, basically the, the theme, the goal, the thesis of the whole Bhagavad Gita is that Krishna tells Arjuna that you basically need to fulfill your duty. You need to fulfill your duty as a warrior. This is how you exist within this world, within this concept, within this battle, within this family. You, Arjuna, are a warrior. And you are charged simply to do your duty. But to do it through selflessness acts. And this is how you should live your life selfless acts and so the battlefield the story of the gita the setting of the gita is actually to be interpreted as an allegorical tale about the ethics and the moral struggles of living the human life that the human life is like a battlefield we can easily choose not to fight we can easily choose to um uh, do horrible and, and grotesque deeds on the battlefield or lose our battle in life and so it uses this allegory allegory of life to talk about the bat of, of talk about of human existence so the text presents a synthesis of human ideas about dharma and about bhakti and about yoga as well that we'll talk about as tools through which we alleviate ourselves and so the goal of life according to the Bhagavad Gita is selfless actions that you are fulfilling your Dharma if you commit your life to selfless acts and so this key uh, understanding this key interpretation was central to Gandhi to Mahatma Gandhi's idea of nonviolence resistance against British rule originally in South Africa, where he gained fame before taking his movement to India to help liberate India from British colonial rule. And so this text is very much inspired, uh, inspiring, let me rephrase that. And this text is, you can find every Hindu knows this story, knows passages from the Bhagavad Gita, and probably owns a copy of the Bhagavad Gita in their home. Uh, politicians, 
here in uh, uh, in India and 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 also here in the United States who happen to be of the Hindu persuasion swear you know on instead of swearing on the Bible the oaths of the Constitution would instead swear on their religious texts and so overwhelmingly they would actually bring a copy of the Bhagavad Gita because they see it in that same parallel so it's a huge significantly religious text within their tradition the next is probably the second most popular text within the populace of the Indian people is the Ramayana so the Ramayana is a very very popular Hindu epic uh, from ancient India that narrates the life of a legendary prince Rama Rama who surprise surprise ends up being at the end of the story an avatar of the Hindu god Vishnu as well the Ramayana is one of the most important pieces of, in, of Indian literature in the world and it has an extremely powerful impact on the culture and the art of India, of South Asia as well. The epic has been adapted uh, to, ne uh, to numerous uh, dramas, plays, uh, books, cartoon books, movies, TV shows, ballets. At one time, uh, a TV show in India, uh, Ramyan, in the 1980s, the late 1980s, still holds the record of being the most watched episode of TV in history because of how important this this story is to the Hindu people to the to the, the populace of India so it's an extremely important epic but a quick summary of what the epic is that the epic follows uh, Rama who uh, un unjustly gets exiled from his kingdom uh, he gets tricked into being exiled by his father. Um, and so it follows, the story follows his 14 year long exile into the wilderness or to the forest. Um, and he travels across the, to, across the forests of India's subcontinent with his wife, Sita, who is also a, a, um, a uh, avatar of the wife of Vishnu that we'll talk about later. Um, and he's also traveling also with his brother I forgot about his brother I forget the name of his brother but it's a very important person but eventually the story hits a climax and they go on all these adventures and things like that they live this perfect life in the wilderness um, but eventually uh, Rama's wife is kidnapped by the evil king Ravana who is the evil king of Lanka and so Rama, then the rest of the story is to goes into to re rescue his wife and starts a war in order to rescue his wife. Eventually, Rama is victorious and following the war, Rama is able to then return home from his exile and to be crowned king and his wife queen and everybody's happy. Everybody lives happily ever after the end. Why the, this story is so important for Hindu culture and Hindu life is that it is imbued with symbolism, both cultural and religious symbolism. Rama is often personified as the ideal person, the Purushutama, the Purushutama within India culture. He is the ideal person that every Hindu is supposed to be and idolizes themselves. He is the best upholder of Dharma which we'll talk about here shortly his life is the template for all Hindus to follow even his wife Sita is very important as well because she's the personification of what femininity is to look like within Hinduism a loyal ever faithful devoted wife to her husband there's even a scene within the Ramayana where Ravana tries to rape Sita and convince Sita that her husband has died in a battle and thus needs to remarry, but she refuses. She stays faithful to her husband and avoids all kinds of temptation. So again, she's the personification of femininity within Hinduism. Um, the last of these significant religious texts 
is the law of Manu, also known as Manu Smarti. And it's to believe to be the first legal text of Hinduism and forms the basis of all rules within Hindu society or the Dharma Satras of how people are should to behave in their life and to live out their Dharma. Uh, the law of Manu is believed to have been written around 200 BCE, maybe 200 CE, sometime around there, the turn of the, the millennial at that time and it appears to have been written and edited by many hands and reflects a crystallization of previous rules and cultures that have been preserved and have continued from a much ancient period of time uh, the laws of manu provide again basic outlines for indian society but more specifically the caste system the caste system or known as the varna and we'll talk about here um, here in just a few seconds but it also talks about codes of conduct of how Indian culture and society is to behave how men and women are to behave how sons and daughters are to behave how, um, how grandchildren how employers employees are to behave and it also marks out the four stages of life for Hindu men so let's get to the social classes here the Varnas the caste system here uh, ancient Hindu society was categorized into these four castes there are the brahmins who are the vedic teachers so brahmins again remember brahmins b-r-a-h-m-i-n not m-a-n that's brahman the ultimate reality the one true god of hinduism we're not talking about that we're talking about the brahmins the brahmins are the vedic teachers they're the priests of societies then there are the Kshatris, the Kshatris, who uh, are the warrior class and the rulers of society. Then there are the Vashais, who were the landowners and the merchants of the cities. Then there are the Shudras, who are the servants and the, and the laborers of the community. And then outside of the fourth or the four caste systems of the Varnas, there is another caste who doesn't is not classified is not considered a part of hindu society but outside of hindu society and those are the dalits the untouchables within society they're the lowest part of hindu society so low that they exist outside of hindu society the three of these varnas the first three of the varnas the brahmins the kshatris and the vashayis are known as the uh, the twice borns, the Divaji, the D Divaji, D V I J A, the Dijavaj, the D Dijavi, Dijavi, as they say it. Uh, and they are the twice borns, meaning that they're not born physically twice, but it's very similar to how it works within Christianity, and that we'll talk about in our Christian lecture. To be born again, to be born spiritually, is the twice born that they are reborn spiritually and they are allowed to study the Vedas. They are allowed to, uh, to uh, be closer within their, within their uh, social stratosphere of being able to achieve moksha while they're in the existence of a human life. However, the Shudras and the Dalits are not. They have to be reborn again into one of those classes. However, there are no Hindu limits to uh, who are the twice born but there is a limitation of gender it seems to be only males are can classified as the twice born so there is some uh, problematics within this um, and uh, within Indian society the caste system each caste is prescribed a certain dharma or a set of duties or a set of behaviors that's what dharma means and we'll talk more about dharma here in a little bit but each of these have a specific mandate within their caste and theoretically there is no upward movement within the caste system during one's lifetime you can't move from being a servant up to a priest you have to be reborn into it 
But by performing one's duties, by performing one's dharma within your caste system, you have the better chances of achieving karma and a higher level of rebirth in the next life through reincarnation. So that's how the, the laws of Manu really worked and how the system worked. It's better, as, as he states in, his, in the book, it's better to do one's own dharma badly than to do another caste dharma very well. So again, you're locked into these certain rules, and so it created an unfair system. But then it, also the law of Manu talks about the twice born are then to requi are required to go through the four stages of life. And again, this is reserved for males only. And that the first stage of human life as one of the twice born is to be that of a student, to be a young man who studies the Vedas and to study other sacred scriptures under the leadership of a guru. And that once they grow up, the second stage is that after they are married, they marry within one of their castes, but is then their, uh, their duties is to be that of the family man, the household, who raise the family, who acquire wealth to protect the family and secure the family, remain faithful to his wife and faithful to his children. But then once his children grow up, then he is to enter a third stage, that of a for, excuse me, forest dweller is how it's termed in the laws of Manu. That again, once the children have grown up, that you are in a state of retirement, you are there to retire from your life and to kind of live the life of an aesthetic, an aesthetic monk. And that's the fourth stage, to completely transition to that. But what about women? What about women? While well, women are to be honored as spiritually and powerful auspicious goddesses, so to speak. Uh, the law of Manu states that a wife's duty, her dharma, is to be faithful. To be faithful to her husband, to worship him as if he was a god, and to not be unfaithful, to obey him in all things, to bear him children, specifically sons, but children, and to never remarry if your husband dies. While historically, um, the law of Manu uh, was observed primarily by the upper class, it seems archaeologically that it was largely ignored by the lower class, because why not? It doesn't benefit them at all. Um, and uh, and but these ideas took root in the Hindu society, and so many of the modernist and the nationalist societies today that we have in Hinduism seeks to try to radically undo what the law of Manu had done for Hindu society. So those are the religious texts. Now let's get us back to um, talking about samsara and dharma. And so what is samsara? Well, within the Dharmaic religion, uh, Dharmaic religion like like Hinduism, the goal of life is liberation, moksha, moksha, M O K S H A, moksha. Uh, if it helps you, you can think of moksha as a parallel to that of salvation, but that's uh, an, an acronym. That's, 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 that's a Western bias that we need to avoid. So instead, think of it as a physical, spiritual liber liberation from this existence on earth. Um, so Hindu, Hinduism believes that every person has an internal soul, an internal self that's immortal, that never dies, it always exists, even if the physical, the corporal here is corruptible, dies and perish. Your soul is yourself, the eternal self, your Atman, Atman. And that upon your death, your lifeless body, your soul departs your lifeless body. And it's reborn, reincarnated into a new body. And we'll continue the process. And this process of reincarnation 
is known as pu, uh, Punara Jaman. Punara Jaman. And it's often depicted within Hinduism using this basic symbol you see here on the screen, that of the wheel. That life, the soul, enters the body at one spoke, this body, you know, the life turns the wheel, and the spirit exits and comes back in, exits, comes back in. You would think that reincarnation, that we get to live our lives forever, is a good thing. No, within Hinduism, it's a bad thing. The goal is not to live and to be immortal and have a fit, immortal physical presence here on earth. No, the goal is not to be stuck in this endless cycle of a merry-go-round here, of life, death, rebirth. The goal is not to be reincarnated. Rather, the goal is to discover the goal is to discern. The goal is to discover your true self. The goal is to discern your true self, that you are part of the divine, that you are a part of Brahman, or B-R-A-H-M-A-N. And that the goal is to discover how to escape this, this endless cycle of life. And the endless cycle of life, death, rebirth within Hinduism is known as samsara. And for Hindus, they see that life, like we will see within Hindu and Buddhism, as well as Jainism, existence, the truth about existence, is that it's suffering. Life living is suffering it's pain we're born when we come into existence even though we might have been conceived at a moment of joy and love and devotion by two people who are in love but if you think about the moment that we are born we're born from pain and agony caused by on to the woman a birthing life out it's a painful event screams horror blood everywhere that's a simple truth about life life is pain when when the child emerges from the birth canal it's screaming it's breathing in oxygen for the first time and it hurts it hurts so again, that's the truth about life, a basic truth about life. Life is suffering. But for Hinduism, Hinduism believes that the physical world is, this physical world is an illusion. That humans believe that, uh, Hindus believe that all humans are blinded to the true reality about themselves, their place within the universe, but also about the universe itself, the universe and uh, yeah, the universe and human experience are described within Hinduism as an interplay between two things: purushu or purusha, sorry, purusha, which is a uh, uh, consciousness, the internal, and park three, park three which is things that are temporal, changing, nature itself. So why Pusha, uh, Hindus say that Pusha is the manifestation of Atman itself, the unchanging thing, the physical world that we happen to exist, the physical body that we happen to inhabit is a manifestation of an illusion, an illusion known as Maya. Maya. And so this illusion sees the physical world as a veil, a giant veil that keeps us from understanding what the physical and natural world is. 
It is Maya that is responsible for our ignorance. It is Maya that is responsible for not knowing, for, for the reality that we are unaware of our true selves. And it's that Maya that is the cause of pain and suffering because we become attached to the physical world. But we, the truth is that we become attached to things that are illusions. Why we experience pain? It's because everything's an illusion. Heartache, sorrow, unfulfilled dreams. It's because all of this is an illusion. Stuff that we don't need. Thus, Maya makes it very oft, uh, hard for us to escape. To escape this kind of existence in this world. So think of the movie Matrix. Think of that famous scene from the movie Matrix with Keanu Reeves, where he's awoken for the first time and sees the world as he is, that the world is nothing but an illusion, a computer algorithm. That he can see once he takes the pill, he sees and awakens to that humans have now just become batteries for the machines batteries for the machines to operate and for them to and uh, 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 to to drain the life source to create electricities for them to exist but to keep the battery happy they put them in this false illusion of a world where they believe they have power and control and they keep the illusion alive but then neo eventually sees the truth that this this existence is nothing but numbers and codes that could be easily interpreted and read. The movie Matrix is basically a big plug for Hinduism. It's Hinduism just reinterpreted into the modern world. The reason that we get stuck in this illusion is because in this incarnation, this endless cycle is because of our actions, our karma, that they keep us tied down actions things like well in order to provide for my family i need a job i need to make money in order to buy food to provide a shelter for my house to provide a shelter for uh um myself too for my kids my children my wife so i need money i need job that's action and the action keeps us bound to the illusion. And we forget, we need to learn what are the right actions to help us break free from the illusion. The illusion that humanity is all is unwoefully unaware of. But when we're able to become awakened, we realize that the goal of our human existence, of why we exist here on earth, why we've been reincarnated at this point in time is for us to escape. So Hindus see that the highest form of reincarnation is that of the human life, the human existence, particularly that of a male existence, unfortunately. That we have a responsibility that once we're alive and exist as a human and a human male that we have the responsibility thus to break free at this moment that if we fail to break free we get stuck in the cycle and that we might based off our actions if they're really bad actions if we're a really bad dude we might get stuck and come back as a role mat, uh, uh, a mole mat, rat, sorry, mole rat, rat. A hairless, blind creature stuck in the earth, stuck in the ground, digging its way, finding worms. We might uh, appear back as a cockroach, an octopus, or we might come back as a prince, a president, a doctor a lawyer. But when we come back, when we have our chance as a human, as a male human, we have a responsibility. And that goal 
is to achieve liberation. So how do we do it? How do we achieve liberation? Well, the goal or how we do it is to follow the path. And within Hinduism, there's multiple paths. But for us, we're going to talk about primarily the three paths, the three paths of the Trigmarka. So, as I said, Hindus believe that there are many paths and that any path within this uh, pathway will lead to the same place, liberation. And that there's not just one way to achieve liberation, not one path for us to achieve un unity back with the Brahman. However, there are many paths. And some Hindus might favor one path or the other based off their incarnation. So the first path that we would want to talk about is that of Karma Marga. Karma Marga, which is the path of action or the path of unselfish action, sometimes known as the path of duty. Karma Yarga teaches that a spiritual seeker should act in accordance to Dharma without being attached to the fruits of personal consequences. Unselfishness. Karma refers to this universal principle of cause and effect. Very Newtonian. Every action has equal or opposite reaction. An individual's action affects everyone and everything, either for the good or for the bad. And it's those actions that bind us and bind someone else to the endless cycle of samsara. The action of, say for example, you at a stoplight here in the city and you happen to look to the left or look to the right and you see a man or a woman begging for money on the street you have a choice at that moment you have an action to do you can give money to the individual you can give food instead of money as a replacement to the individual you can give the person a ride instead to help them go get some money to help them go get some food or you can ignore them but regardless within the system of hinduism every action that you choose has a consequence whether good or bad if you just simply give the guy money the guy or the girl could be lying she just needs money for another quick fix another drink of alcohol another uh, chance for them to go buy some methamphetamines to get high that night. Or they might indeed need food. They're starving. They've been several days without food. They need just a simple Big Mac to get through the day. That $5 could help go a long way. You don't know. But actions can be good or bad. And you're constantly faced with them. Living life is nothing but that. Action after action after action. This path of karma marga or karma yoga is found extensively in the Bhagavad Gita. So this is the main text of it. Krishna describes karma yoga as a spiritual practice to Arjun, Arjuna, sorry, of selfless acts performed for the benefits of others. Where one downplays one's own exclusive role or own exclusive interest, Krishna argues instead that we should consider the interest of all parties involved and all parties impartially and then do the right thing, a.k.a. the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have do unto you. 
That's karma yoga, karma marga. Karma marga purifies the mind. By that simple, basic dichot, that basic understanding of actions of any moment when you encounter, again, you encounter the stranger on the side of the road, you're not to think of, oh, they're just going to go hit, get, you know, uh, another hit from the drug that they're hooked on. I'm just feeding the system. No, you are to put yourself in their situation. How would you wish someone to see you if you're that desperate that you're on the side of the road begging? You, who's a good, upstanding person, who has morals, who was raised right. How would you wish someone to judge you? Assume the worst or assume the good? Do unto others as you would wish done unto you. That's what Jesus Christ says. The same thing in the Bhagavad Gita here, written 500 years before, possibly, the birth of Jesus. That's a universal principle, guys, across all faiths and traditions. It's just an act of human decency. Do unto others as you would have done unto you. It's best to live your life this way. It's best to deal with the consequences of actions. As Krishna argues, the best way to deal with it is impartiality. Don't think of the worst scenario in people. Think of yourself in them, in that scenario. And so it purifies the mind. It purifies why we're at. It leads one to consider work according to one's dharma as doing the work of God. And since the becoming like, you can become like Krishna or the Barma, of uh, the Brahman in every moment of one's life by your actions, your duties. Karma Marga is a path of ritual actions instead. That's really what you should think about it that way, of unselfish actions as ritual actions. That there's more than just one way to worship the deities, to offer prayers and sacrifice. The best way is to live your life, but live your right, life the right way, with the right duties the right attitude, the right charisma. So what is Dharma uh, at this point? So Dharma at this point is a fundamental concept within Hinduism. And we've kind of talked about it over and over again but it's basically, if I can dumb it down for all of us, Dharma just refers to ethical and moral behaviors. Ethical and moral behaviors that uphold the universe, that encompasses all the principles and values that guide individuals towards righteousness and good conduct and to the pursuit of the aims of life. In Hinduism, Dharma is a universal law. Ethics, behavior, morality are universals. And that they govern aspects of our existence. And that they sustain life and harmonize life and the individual with society and nature. How to be a good person. Be a moral person. How to live in society and be contributed. Be ethnically right and good. So Dharma is very closely linked to the concept of karma. And according to Hindu belief, by following your Dharma, an individual can accumulate the right kind of karma, which will lead to a positive rebirth, which will ultimately lead to the achievement of moksha. So for example, the Dharma of a student is to acquire spiritual knowledge. The dharma of a householder is to raise the fa his family right, provide for them, support them, and to be good citizens and contribute to society. The dharma of a renuncier, an aesthetic monk, is to speak s s uh, spiritual liber liberation by through disattachment and abandonment. 
So in Hinduism, Dharma is considered the basis of all morality. The principles of Dharma are righteousness, duty, justice, compassion. And again, they're universals, universals. Principles that not only guide individual behavior, but guide societal and political institutions, such as the caste system, such as the rule of law and governance. And so again, Dharma is very linked, is very closely linked to the Varnas, which we've already talked about, the caste system. Still, um, there's another aspect that um, that we kind of already hit at and touched at. So I, uh, I'll mention it here that we've kind of gone through already. But it's that idea of Purushathras. And so you can see here that, like I said, Hinduism believes this about the Dharma, that it's this universal law that governs all aspects of human existence. It is linked to karma. It's linked to our Hindu beliefs about, uh, and it's linked to where you will reemerge upon your rebirths. It's a link to the caste systems. And so here's the forecast that we've already talked about. Um, but the big thing that I wanted to talk about is the next, next slide and what is at the aim of living through this pathway of karma yara, marga is the four aims of life the puru sartras the four aims of life um, they are considered to be very essential within Hinduism of leading a fulfilling and meaningful life. And so sometimes the, the uh, Purusatras kind of get seen as this contradiction, because again, if, if human life, the physical life is an illusion, then why should we be so focused on living the right type of life? Well, because again, it's about actions. So having the right type of life, having the right actions, human life, in the Dharmaic religions are seen as the highest form of reincarnation and that the final form that the soul needs for itself to achieve liberation. So human life should not be wasted here. And instead, it should be uh, seen as a responsibility and the pursuit of that responsibility for the average Hindu person is the Purushathras. So what are they? Well, the first of them is we've already talked about over and over again and hitting home over and over again is that of the Dharma. And this refers again to the pursuit of righteousness, this pursuit of moral duty, of ethical conduct and behavior. And it's the most important goal of human existence, living your Dharma doing your dharma dharma encompasses all aspects of life personal behavior social relationships religious observances dharma is significantly important so i won't hit that hard hit that much too hard here but the next one is arthra and this refers to a pursuit of material wealth and success but the right kinds the right kinds of acquisitions. And so this again, as this speaks to the role of the householder, that uh, uh, accruing wealth in this life is not so much a bad thing. It's not so much a bad thing. It's just as long as you have the right motivations, the right actions behind why you're pursuing this material wealth and prosperity and success is because it allows you to have stability and security for the pursuit of later things. Arthur encompasses a wide range of activities, trade, commerce, or agriculture, but more importantly, the development of certain skills and abilities to allow you to achieve stability in the household. So to have a happy home, you need to have a happy wife, 
but also to have a happy home, you need to have stability, financial stability. So as part of the householder, of the male role or the father figure, you should provide for your children, you should provide for their education, make sure that they have every ability to succeed in life. And now, because again, the goal of life is to achieve moksha and liberation. So you need to have the right scenario and situations around you to achieve these things. But the pursuit of arthra is not an end to itself, but rather as a means. So think of it as a means to an end. It is considered to only be one aspect of a balanced and fulfilled life. That pursuit of arthra must be balanced with the pursuit of the other, uh, other aims of life. So if you are achieving wealth, you're achieving it in a morally way, a righteous way, an ethically way. That if you're providing for your family, you're doing it the right way for the right purposes. So, it, but again, it's a launching pad. So think of Arthra as a launching pad for you to have success. So it's a part of this circle that helps you break through. The next one is Kama. Kama, this refers to the pursuit of pleasure and enjoyment, particularly the sensual and the aesthetic kinds of pleasures. So karma invites a wide range of activities which include falling in love, being romantic, <laughs> and particularly within Hinduism, having lots and lots of sex with your wife. The Karma Sutra, we all know that book, that's part of it. It's part of the pursuit of life and enjoyment and fulfillment. So that's part of life, but in Hindu philosophy, the pursuit of Kama is seen as a natural and necessary one of human existence. It's not seen as something selfish and something physical that, oh, I need to get my fix, rather as an opportunity to experience joy and pleasure that is ethical and just and in accordance to one's duty in life. So again, we're uh, a man is supposed to be married in Hindu society. And part of the duties of marriage is to have children and to have a happy spouse. And part of having children is having sex. And part of having a happy spouse is having sex. So that's why it's part of it and having this balance. But it's having the right kind of balance. Because if you're doing it for the wrong re reasons, having, uh, you know, having uh, extramarital sex and things like that, it falls outside your purview of dharma. That's an unrighteous thing to do. That's an unethical thing to do. And it's not providing stability, arthra, for your family. So there does there is a logic within this, but it's something that we see as something different and as a contradiction. Because again, if life is Maya, why do all these things? No, oh, it's a goal to have a right perspective. And then the last, of course, the pursuit of life is moksha, the spiritual liberation, something that we will dive more into here with our pathways as we go. But in accordance to Hindu philosophy. The pursuit of the four uh, is, again, about balance and integrated into a harmonious whole. So while each goal is important in its own right, they're not to be seen as separate things or conflicting things, rather as complementary aspects. It's about a lifelong journey. So the second goal or the second pathway, let me rephrase that way, of the Trigmara is Yana Marga, Yana Marga, which is also known as the path of wisdom. And it is, a, it puts a, our path of self realization. And Yana Marga emphasizes the pursuit of knowledge and understanding as a means to obtain spiritual enlightenment. The fundamental principle of Yana Marga is that the ultimate reality or truth is not just simply as non-dual, 
but it's also it's all pervasive. It's in everything and everywhere and in every existence, including ourselves, that we are a part of the essential one, that we are a part of the Brahma. So the goal of Yanamarga is to realize this truth through the cultivation of knowledge and understanding. The path of Yana Marga is not an easy one. And it's not a path that is accessible to everyone. Not everyone can do it because it requires deep commitment to the pursuit of knowledge and understanding. And it's reserved for only the, of a few people who have a strong desire for spiritual liberation and enlightenment through knowledge. These few people are known as the sadhus, sadhus, who are the holy men or holy women who have renounced worldly life and possessions and the pursuit of spiritual liberation and spiritual enlightenment. They are considered to be devoting themselves to God, devotees of God, and are respected within Hindu society for their deep level of spiritual commitment, spirituality, and the dedication they have to the chosen pathway of Yana Marga. The Sahus uh, live a life of simplicity and austerity. They often practice meditation and yoga, yoga not being the exercise movement and craze, but yoga as a tool for stretching out if I can I use that word the stretching out or the empower or the the awakening of the inner self that's really what you're supposed to do with yoga is to help attach yourself to your inner self so why you put yourself in these unique positions is to help wake up the, the inner self in a sense so yeah yoga Practicing meditation, spiritual practices that help them obtain a higher state of consciousness. Um, the sahus uh, typically wear orange, orange robes, um, sometimes other traditional clothing as well, sometimes white. Um, and they may live alone or they may live in small communities with other sadhus. The path of Yana Marga begins with the recognition of the limitations of the human mind and that the need to transcend them in order to realize the ultimate truth. This recognition often arises from the experiences of suffering and the realization that material possessions of, and worldly pleasures are ultimately unsatisfying and impermanent. We're going to see that word a lot when we get to Buddhism. Once an individual recognizes uh, the limitations of the mind, they start to begin a process of inquiry or of self-reflection known as Atmanyana. Atmanyana. This involves questioning the nature of reality, the nature of the self, and the relationship between reality and the self. Uh, the process also is supported by scriptural studies, so things like the Upanishads, uh, which contain teachings and insights to these questions. It also requires self-discipline. Self-discipline and meditation, dhyana, dhyana, uh, as one of the main characters, uh, uh, not characteristics, one of the main challenges, yeah, that's the right word, challenges to uh, the tendency of the human mind to be distracted and for the human mind to be attracted to worldly desires and pleasures, attachment. So discipline, self-meditation, our meditation helps to unattach yourself from the world. So this attachment that we have, the distraction of the human mind, is what helps creates the veil of ignorance and illusion. So meditation helps to quiet the mind and to uh, cultivate a state of awareness that is conducive for you to realize the ultimate truth 
about the world and about the universe. And the self-disciplines that you need as this ascetic monk helps you to overcome the tendencies of the mind to and helps to, to cultivate again this detachment. So again, that's why you do these things. Uh, practitioners of Yana Marga often are usually aided by a guru. So a guru uh, in Dharmaic cultures is a is just a uh, a title for a spiritual leader or a spiritual mentor, and that within Yana Marga or Yana Yoga. There are three practices, three common practices that all practitioners follow. They are, our behaviors too, is another way to say it, but they are saravana, which is hearing. So you hear from a master, you, you, you hear the teachings of a master, you um, uh, make yourself a part of his community of followers, you detach yourself from the rest of existence and go and hear from a guru, hear from a spiritual leader. Another practice is that of manana, manana, which is thinking, contemplating. Sometimes that involves contemplating on your own, contemplating within a group. And then the last is nidahasana, which is meditation. Meditation on the, what you have heard, on what you've been thinking, and meditating to help cultivate a calm mind for you to be able to d detach yourself more and more from existence. Detach yourself from the physical world so that you can go and find your true self. Also within Yana, um, uh, uh, Yana Marga is also known as the, the four attitudes that you are to have and that you are helped to, to, to cultivate within yourself and which involve uh, uh, the ability to discriminate what you see more clearly, have a, a more discerning mind is probably the better term here. Let's go with that, discerning mind. Um, Disattachment, rejection of the comforts of, of life, of possessions, of property that keeps us further tied down, an intense yearning to achieve spiritualization, that you're willing to abandon all things for this one pursuit, and then to maintain virtue, which virtue within uh, Yana Marga consists of six things, a temperance mind, temperance of action, withdrawal of desires, restraint, faith in the process, and concentration. And many on the path take up asceticism, which asceticism, I've said a lot here. I don't think I've defined it yet, but when I say asceticism, I'm talking about a lifestyle. A lifestyle that characterizes itself by abstinence, abstinence of sensual pleasures for the sole purpose of pursuing spiritual growth and spiritual goal. Um, let's see, anything else that I can think of here? Oh yeah, yeah, since we're talking about this, this one you know, deals a lot with meditation. I think this is a good point here. I don't have it in the slides, but this is a good point here to think about and to mention about the importance of meditation and particularly mantra meditation, which is very common within Hinduism, but more or less all Eastern religions of this time, mantra meditation, why people do that. Mantra meditation involves repeating a mantra or sacred sounds or sacred words, such as Om, which is very important within the Hindu culture here. The reason you, you repeat these sounds is because it helps for you to focus on them to maintain a deep level of concentration. So these words have some kind of spiritual power uh, within them. Uh, oh yeah, I think I do have this in the slide now, I'm thinking about it. Yes, meditation, awesome. So OM here, yes, OM, deep concentration levels. So OM, um, uh, yes, OM, has involves uh, 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 is this sacred sound and symbol within Hinduism? I actually have it earlier on. It's the most common symbol of Hinduism. 
In fact, I have it. Uh, I didn't mean it. I didn't talk about it up here. So let me get back to it here. Yes, this symbol right here is the symbol of Om. So let's get back to here. Yes. So the Om, the Om sound and symbol in Hinduism represents Rama. That's what it is. So by saying Om, 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 you're const you're you're meditating. You're developing this deep level of concentration on the ultimate reality, on Brahman. So it's a very powerful symbol. So the sound of Om is often chanted, repeated in prayers, and is believed to have this powerful effect on the consciousness, as well as the vibrations of the sound inside your body. So, so um, 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 you feel the vibration of your vocal cords, and you feel that vibration even go down into your rest of your body. So within Hinduism, it believes that vibration is actually activating an inter-energy within you. And many of us know what it's about, the chakras that we'll talk about here in a few seconds. So the so there's a very important aspect of why we do it, and that Om is seen as as a representation of Brahma, which is the essence of all creation here. It's both future, past, present. It has this in a cycle. It represents everything within the universe, and this is why it helps us to represent. This is what we're journeying towards. So it's like a longing devotion. And so that's the, one of the most common types of, of mantra meditation or meditation is the mantra meditation. There's also the breathing meditation uh, that involves focusing your breathing in order to calm the mind. And so there's certain various breathing techniques that you can do. There's applications that you can do on your phone um, as well to help calm the mind. And you'll see it works. You'll lower, you can be able to lower your blood pressure instantly you'll feel much calmer and peaceful by just controlling and focusing on your breathing, which then helps to you realize that your mind can start to wonder all of a sudden, wonder on nothingness. Um, so it's very powerful, very powerful way. Um, but uh, uh, part of the mantra meditations is the chakra meditation. So chakra within Hinduism is this belief of, of an eternal energy that exists inside of us, part of the Atman, the soul, and so the energy center has various places within our body that needs to be channeled in order to help us achieve enlightenment in a sense. And so there are various channels within the body at different spots, and so you can see them here the root chakra, the heart chakra, the throat chakra, the crown chakra, they all have different types of meanings and elements. But the goal of them, again, is to channel the energy of your body because again, and, and channel, channel the energy of your soul, more or less, because you are part of the divine. You are part of the Brahman. You just don't realize it. So by doing these meditations, it helps to instill within you and to help block or unblock things that are keeping you physically here and emotionally here and keeping you imbalanced. And so by having your chakras aligned, you're becoming more balanced with your true self, the Atman. And there's also yoga med meditations. And so this involves the physical posturings, the asanas, uh, with meditation in order to achieve a deeper state of awareness and connection with the divine. Um, and then there's also uh, Japa meditation, which um, I've been more familiar with that versus the breathing. It's where you, uh, instead of focusing on your breath and controlling your breath and how you're breathing and controlling your body to, to focus things, you use external things. And so this is what really a lot of Catholics Buddhists and Muslims do as well by using prayer be beads. You focus on the beads to help you meditate and pray, running them through your fingers, feeling the coarseness of the, sto of the stones or the pieces of wood helps you within the meditations. Or you have certain repetitions, sounds that you would make on each and every bead that you would repeat over and over again to help create that level of concentration. Um, for you to achieve 
moksha. So the last of the three of the uh, uh, marga is bhakti marga, bhakti marga, known as the pathway of devotion. And this refers to spiritual practices within uh, Hinduism that focuses on specifically loving devotion, which the English, a better English translation would be worship. Loving worship, intense worship towards a personal deity as a pathway of moksha. Because bhakti keeps one away from negativity and evil through worshiping the deity, it causes a spiritual transformation because of your love for the gods. And so often you'll see in Hinduism, another Hindu proverb, famous one, is to know God is to know yourself. That's a Hindu proverb. And so bhakti is seen as the highest form of spiritual practice within Hinduism. Um, and in a sense, it really emerged as a counter movement to Buddhism, to Jainism, to later uh, Islam and Sikhism, um, as well as the philosophical movements within Buddhism as well. Because Buddhism and Jainism Argued and believed that there, there is, they deny the existence of the gods, saying that there is no such thing as faith, there is no such thing as grace, there is no such thing as mercy of the gods, that personal liberation, personal salvation is your responsibility and your responsibility alone, that no one else can save you. And it's even both disheartening, because even though it's both Buddhism and Jainism at one time were the dominant forms of religion within Hindu history, that had even imperial favorships. Um, both of these traditions, and even the philosophical traditions of Hinduism, was was very limiting, limiting to only a few. Only a few could participate in Yana Marga. Only a few could be ascetics. Only a few could be, you know, it had to be males to participate. Women weren't allowed to participate in the reincarnation. They had to reincarnate as a male in order to achieve moksha. And so, bhakti was really, bhakti marga was really, this bhakti devotion materials was really a counter movement aimed at rescuing the downtrodden. Aimed to be more for the common people. The people that didn't have the social ability, the financial abilities, to do the rest. So it was aimed at the lowest common denominator of people, the lowest end, the 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 the, 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 not, the not twice born. And so it's it, it has a different holds a different place. It's a very different feeling. Bhakti is very powerful and transformational. Um, because there was four kinds of devotees that it really focused on. It focused on those that were like I've been kind of saying over and over again here, the ones that were the hard pressed, the ones that were stressed uh, because of their life circumstances. If they couldn't achieve moksha in the way of karma, of karma marga, they couldn't achieve moksha through the wisdoms of the ascetics. Bhakti yoga becomes a relief for those. It was uh, um, for those who uh, believed in, in, in uh, the uh, I'm trying to think of a way to say it. Sort of, it was yeah, the best way I could say it is like it was a counter reaction. A counter movement for the people. And it's seen as the most expansive way of Hinduism that we have. And it's probably the one that is the most famous and the more classical. It's the most expensive way because people can now achieve liberation through worship. Worship of gods at temples, private home shrines, pilgrimages, going and participating in religious festivals. The things that average people can do. And at the heart of bhakti are the expressions of statues, the images, the idols 
of the deity called Marti. And that the Murtis are these symbolic icons. They're not the gods themselves, but rather the, it is believed that the gods embodied or they're the manifestations of the divine. They're uh, often compared to, within Hinduism, as photographs of a lover that you have that you might keep in your wallet or that you might keep in your phone or on your screensaver for your phone. It's not a representation, you know, it's not the actual person itself, but it's a representation of them that's very sacred to you. That every time you look at it, you're reminded of them and you have these emotional ties and feelings attached to them and values attached to these things. That's what Murti is. When a person worships at a Murti statue, the worshiper's spiritual ideas and needs are mediated through the Murti. Yet the idea of Brahman is not confined to the Murti. He doesn't exist. It doesn't exist there. So it's very similar to the notions in Christianity of meditating on the cross or holy relics or images of saints. Within Christianity, Christianity argues that all those things are channels of focus. And that's what Murti is too. It's a channel of focus. It's not the point of focus, but the channel of focus. So Murtis are typically made of stone, um, from the past or wood, but today primarily they're metal, cast of metal, sometimes clay in certain regions for certain, for certain purposes, clay statues that were made. Uh, Murti, when properly uh, produced, are made in accordance with very specific rules and guides and recommendations of materials that should be used, particular measurements. It's very um, high oriented because each detail of the statue represents something. And at each stage of the manufacturer, there's a prescribed uh, specific mantra that must be said in order to help sanctify the process as an invoke and uh, the to, yeah, to invoke the power of the deity on the image. Um, Murtis are often treated as, as important guests uh, and that people will often, uh, part of the traditions that they have them in their homes is to serve serve the Murti in a participation that's known as the Puja, which is a worship service. The Puja is a ritual offering that's offered as a devotional homage uh, and prayers are often done before the deity. The host um, honors the statue um, uh, uh, by giving it food, by giving it drink, sometimes even clothing it. Um, as well, uh, because it's a sign of respect and devotion. And focus and devotion on the puja is seen as similar to the way that meditation works within Mahayana, or no, not Mahayana, um, between um, um, Jhana Marga to help purify the mind and purify the heart. So it establishes a deep connection between you and the gods, which is a, a connection to the Brahma. So bhakti is the expression in many different ways of Hinduism. But it's the most common form and the common expression. Bhakti allows for singing, of dancing, of cheering, of songs. Because it's all about, again, connecting yourself to the, uh, to the Brahma. Because they're all one. Same goal that you have of, of, of the other pathways. And so by singing, by dancing, you have these celebrations, even participating in religious festivals. And that's what I want to talk about here now, is that the best example of bhakti is the religious festival of Holi. So Holi is a very extremely popular Hindu festival, two-day festival. It's the festival of colors as you can see here from the image, but it's also known as the Festival of Love. Um, the origins of Holi, uh, they vary from region to region on the subcontinent, um, and they mean different things, and they're commemorated in different ways within the subcontinent of, of India. But however, I'm gonna give you the overall story that unites them all. So Holi celebrates Primarily the eternal and divine love between Radha, a princess, and the Hindu god Krishna. 
But it also signifies, on the other side of the coin, a, tr a cosmic triumph of what true devotional faith in the god Vishnu can do for a father, Prayata, uh, Pralada. So there's two stories that go along with Holly, the story of love, but also the story of devotion. And so that's why it's known as the Festival of Love, Festival of Colors, Festival of Devotion, because of these two connections. But I'm going to start with the story of Radha and Krishna. So the story of Radha and Krishna is a, uh, a, 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 yeah, a literary representation of what normal Indians have experienced and continue to experience in their society and cultures today. As the story goes, Krishna, when he was born um, as a physical human being, as his avatar, Krishna was very much a dark-skinned Indian that often gets pictured in images as being blue skin, of having this dark, very dark skin. And he was in love with a princess, Radha, who was a lighter-skinned Indian. So within Indian culture, still today, a lighter skin complexion is very desirable among Indians. And so many Indians will put on specialized, well, women or men will put on specialized makeup in order to lighten their skin color. Because darker skins tend to have lesser opportunities than light skin in India. Darker skins tend to have a lesser status as well. So it's a sad state of affair, but the story talks about this and deals with it in a religious context in the ceremony. So the story goes is that Radha and Krishna were deep in love, but the dark-skinned Krishna feared that Radha would not love him because of his skin color. So like any good boy who's in love, what does he do? He goes and asks his mom for help. What do I do? What should I do? How should I, what can I do to win this girl over? He asked his mom, and his mom came up with a great plan, like all moms do. She came up with a plan to have Krishna take a handful of different pigments of colored dye powder in his hand and said, I want you to take these to Krishna and tell her what skin color would you like me to have. And so Krishna loves that idea so he takes a handful of different color pigments and he runs up to Krishna confesses his or runs up to Radha confesses his love to Radha uh, and how much he loves her and, but he also says you know but I, I, I want you to tell me which color I love you so much that I want you, I want you to find me appealing and desirable so which color do you want me to be and Radha, playfully, is already in love with him, takes the powder and throws it in his face in a playful and jovial way, it signifies that she loves Krishna for the way he is. And so the two kiss, they fall in love, they get married and have their happy Hollywood ha ever after ending. So it's in that same spirit that when you look at Holly, you see images of Holly, Participants in Holly gather themselves and they throw colored powder in a jovial way to, to each other and paint everyone in these colorful shades of color because it's an act of love and an act of hope that the message signifies that the Hindus can transcend cultural and social barriers through the power of love. There's a beautiful story. But the festival, however, doesn't begin and end with the throwing of colored powder at each other. It involves much more than that. The festival of Holly also begins the night before with a large bonfire. And the bonfire tells a different story. The events that relate to the story of Pralada and Vishnu, who is also Krishna because of his avatar, and his father, the demon king Hirana Yakusupu. So the story goes that the demon king, Hirana Yaksapuhu, thought himself to be worthy of worship, that he should be worshipped like a god himself. And so he decides, I'm going to force all within my kingdom to worship me instead of Vishnu. 
So everybody in the kingdom applies with the king's order to worship him except one person, Pralada, who happens to be the demon king's own son. Pralada refuses and insists on honoring Vishnu alone. So in a fit of rage, his father tries to punish Pralada for his devotion. But in faith, uh, um, but his faith in Vishnu never wanes. He throws him in prison. He locks him up. Pralada never abandons his faith. So finally, in the last bit of fit of rage, the king decides in this great insult, I'm going to burn my own son alive at this stake. But his sister, Holika, the king's sister, Holika, is fearful that Vishnu will try to rescue the boy. So instead says, hey, this is what we'll do. I am going to go into the fire with Prilata. I'm going to secure him down and I'm going to hold him and I'm going to be able to prevent Vishnu from rescuing Prilata from the fires. Because Holika explained that she had a secret weapon, which in Hindu literature is called a boon, but it seems to be some type of protective cloak that she would wear. This protective cloak that she would wear would protect her from the flames. So she would be holding on to Pralada while she's wearing this cloak, and Pralada would burn to death while Holika would be unharmed. And so she sits the boy on her lap and holds him down while they build the fire. But unfortunately, as the story goes, Holika's plan backfires, quite literally, in that Vishnu causes a strong wind to blow and to blow up and to blow Holika's cloak up from covering her body and uncovering it to instead cover Pralada who's sitting up in his arm, her arms. And so the, it's the king's sister who burns alive in the flames while the boy is protected from the fire. So that's why today Hindus build this lodge bonfire to replicate Pralada's endangerment and also to celebrate his rescues from the fire by Vishnu because of his faith and devotion to Vishnu alone. So the bonfires are lit in a ceremony known as Holika Dana, which is the burning of Holika. And people gather near the fire, sing and dance, and they throw items into the fire, cursing Holika. So the story commemorates the faith. And so it shows you how faith can overcome dangers and give you liberation. So, so this is Bhakti Marga. So the last thing that I want to talk about are the gods themselves of Hinduism. That's really what Hinduism is famous for, is their gods. And so, as I mentioned already, the gods and goddesses of Hinduism are quite varied. And there's supposedly around 33 million deities uh, within the faith of, his, of Hinduism. And that evolved over time their importance and prominence within the Hindu culture. And so within Hindu scholarship, there's various periods in which the Hindus deities all appear and disappear, and reappear or evolve and change over time. There's the Vedic periods, the classic period, the medieval period, the modern period. Um, for much of what I'm going to be talking about, it's going to be talking about the classic to medieval period, as we know as classical as uh, Hinduism. Um, but before we can digress, it's vital and important to ask why that many deities. And we already talked about it too. Hinduism is inclusive. It's an embracive religion. So it sees many, many, many paths to the gods. And all of the gods are representations of the one mountain, that of Brahma. So Hindus, religious figures like the Buddha, even Jesus Christ, are seen as just mere avatars of Vishnu, manifestations of Brahma, who are worthy of devotion and worship as well. So despite so many gods and goddesses, the ultimate of what they are, they are the ultimate reality, the ultimate manifestations of Brahma. So there is no contradiction if one Hindu worships Ganesh over worshiping Lakshmi, 
or worship Shiva over worshiping another god like Vishnu. They're all the same. But it's also important too to know why there's so many deities is because India is a very big place and it's often forgot about that. It's often forgotten that India is a culmination of 400 different languages and cultures on the subcontinent in one nation. So India is just not one culture and one people. It's a synthesis of cultures and people. So that's why they have so many div divinities and divine beings. Real quick, within the religion of Hinduism, the deities are referred to as two names, either a diva, which is a masculine god, a god, or a divi, a feminine. So a diva or a divi, feminine, the goddess. And both of them mean the same thing, shiny one, heavenly one, a divine person. There's also some other gods as well within the Hindu scriptures. They're known as um, Ashuras, which are demigods, part humans, part divines. And originally they were indistinguishable between the divas and the divas. Uh, but however, in the post-Vedic periods, the devas became representations of the good gods and are representations of light, while as the Ashuras become bad gods or anti-gods or demons as well. So this is where you get some of the demon language from. Um, uh, let's see. I don't think I, I don't think I'm going to need to talk about the uh, old Vedic gods. I thought about that that I might mention about Idra. Agni, I guess I would mention only Agni. Agni is the only one that's still kind of important of the old Vedic gods that's still around. Um, uh, Agni is the god of fire within Hinduism, but he's, uh, he's always associated with Hindu sacrifices, either the Yarna or the Homa that are often used still to these days. So even like if you go to a, a Hindu wedding, they still do fire sacrifices not sacrifices of animals, but you know, having building a fire and then pouring um, special drinks, milks, food into the fire. Um, but why he's important is because of his role with fire and its role with sacrifices. So Agni is seen as the mouthpiece of the gods and as the medium between the gods and humans. So he's the messenger god between them. So that's all I want to mention about Agni. He's very important. He appears lots in the Vegas and he's the only god of the Vega of the Vedas period that still exists today and that some of the old worship styles are still done. And so I just wanted to mention about that before we get into the big bulk of the classical forms of gods. Um, and then, so you have also with the emergence of uh, philosophical Hinduism, the, the Hindu gods themselves become more symbolic. They become more allegorized as just mere spiritual concepts. So they, the gods do go away at a time in Hindu culture. Um, and so that explains why there's a difference between the gods of the Vedas and later gods like Shiva and Vishnu who don't appear in the Vedas, but then now all of a sudden appear. Um, some scholars believe it's because of the full philosophical movement with Hinduism that de-emphasized the gods, but then the Bhakti movement brought them back and a new emergence of gods and the importance of gods within society. So why the Bhakti movement is so important and that we need to discuss. And this is what the remaining of our discussions will be They're on the gods and goddesses of Hinduism, classical Hinduism. The gods and goddesses of classical Hinduism are known traditionally as um, these two classifications, um, the Trimurti and the Tridevi. They're, even though there's multiple gods, many more gods, these are the more most important and traditional gods within Hinduism. The Trimurti, the three forms, and the are the three, three male gods, the prominent three male gods that appear the most, and the prominent three female goddesses that appear most in society. And so that's where the rest of the lecture is going to deal with. So let's now dive into the Trimurti. So the Trimurti exists of three deities. The first 
is Brahma. So again, this is this is the other Brahma. So not to be confused with Brahman, B-R-A-H-M-A-N, the one universal, the ultimate reality that all gods and all existence exist into him. Not to be confused with him, nor is it to be confused with the priest of the caste system, the Brahmin, B-R-A-H-M-I-N. So again, not to be confused. Brahma is a god. Brahma, B A B R A H M A, is a Hindu god. He is known as the self born. Uh, and he is born uh, from Hinduism. He's born from a golden egg, meaning that he has no real origin because he existed in the egg, but Hinduism never tells where the egg began. He was born from a golden egg and arose from the ocean, and he is seen as the creator god of Hinduism. And he's often associated with knowledge and the creators of the Vedas. Brahma is commonly depicted as a red or golden complexion bearded man. So you can see him at the bottom right. A man with four heads, crown, and hands and seated on a lotus flower. His four heads represent the four Vedas. And he is also pointed in the four cardinal directions, meaning he sees all things. Uh, the goddess Saraswati is also mentioned as Brahma's wife, and she's represented as this creative energy, since he's the god of creation. She's the, as well as the go goddess of creation. So creation involves both male and female aspects of uh, the form. But however, during the post Vedic period, Brahma was a very prominent deity and his sect, he had a, a sect that existed that worshiped him exclusively. But starting around the seventh century, um, we see a decline in his worship. Uh, and rarely today is he worshiped as a primary deity within Hinduism. But he still remains a central part of the Trimurti because of him being synonymous with the power of creation. He's the creator God. And he's also synonymous with a central part of the fundamental force of the universe as well. Uh, Brahma is also, uh, as I said, he's, uh, he has also depicted with four hands and they carry certain things within them. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember them all here because I know the lotus flower um, is a representation of intellect and reasoning. Um, he has a uh, some kind of um, it's like a pot um, that uh, represents um, creation and imagination um, and I can't remember the other ones in his hands yes but you can see him there on the far bottom right of the screen the next is Vishnu 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 is known as the preserver who protects and transforms the universe and is the supreme deity of the uh, Vaishnavism form of Hinduism. So it's a sect within Hinduism that worships him exclusive, exclusive, sometimes known as Vishnuism, but it refers to a denomination within Hinduism that worships him alone or him exclusively. So this would be a form of henotheism, as we talked about in one of our first lectures. Henotheism, that you believe in many other gods, but you primarily worship one god alone. Um, and his form, or his denomination of Hinduism, Vishnuism, is actually in fact the largest denomination of Hinduism out there, around 64 million followers, or 67% of all Hindus see themselves as followers of Vishnu. So according to Vaishnavism or Vishnizum, um, whenever, whenever the universe is threatened by evil or chaos or a um, destructive force, uh, Vishnu defend, descends to earth in the form of an avatar uh, to, in order to restore cosmic order in order to protect the Dharma. Therefore, uh, Vishnu is often depicted as uh, a benevolent, loving, 
deity, but also very fearsome because he fights in every scenario when he comes down, except one, when he comes down to earth, he fights. He always fights. Um, so the word, uh, I've said this a lot already. I don't think I've described it, but the word avatar, I think I need to describe it here, just means in, in Sanskrit to descend. And it signifies the, the incarnation of a deity in earth. So Jesus Christ is an avatar of God, um, the, the incarnation of the deity on earth. Uh, Vishnuism claims that there's around um, 10 avatars of Vishnu that are all called Dashavarata. But the three most prominent of the avatars that get the most treatment within stories about Vishnu are Rama, who we already talked about from Ramayana, Krishna, so we've seen Krishna a lot, the Bhagavad Gita or the festival of Holi, as well as the Buddha. Within Hinduism, they see the Buddha as an incarnation of Vishnu. Uh, within Vishnuism, the sect only worships, um, there are, or within Vishnu, there is a sect that only worships one specific avatar of Vishnu. Uh, those, those are the Hare Krishna movement. So there are some that only worships him. Um, Vishnu's iconography is a little bit different. So he's the one in the... Um, oh my gosh, I'm trying to remember which one is he. He's in, Oh yeah, the top uh, right left is Vishnu. So he's often depicted with blue skin. So you can see here, sometimes very dark blue skin or sometimes a gray skin, black sometimes as well because of his dark skin. He's always well-dressed, uh, jeweled with four arms. You can see all of them, they're very crazy about having four arms, but they hold specific things. So he holds a conch shell. So you can see the conch shell in his right, um, right hand, his upper right hand, uh, which symbolizes chakra the chakra energy. Um, he also holds a war disc in his hand, which symbolizes restoration of the Dharma in order to combat things. You can't see it below, but he also has a club in his hand, which shows his power and a lotus flower, which shows his ability, uh, the, the, the emphasis of transcendence. Um, Shiva is the next one that I want to talk about. Shiva, the third one, known as the destroyer. So you can see the Trigmarti, the creator, the preserver, and the destroyer, the circle of samsara that exists here. That's why these three gods are mentioned the most. Shiva, the destroyer. Sometimes you will see the old phrase Rudra um, as well from the Vedas. People believe that Shiva did exist in the Vedas as Rudra, but however, he's probably known as Shiva. Uh, Shiva is the Hindu god of death, as well as the god of time, meditation, and the arts, and is the supreme deity of the Hindu denomination, Shivaism. So Shivaism is this Hindu denomination that worships almost exclusively the god Shiva. And incorporates very, various yoga-oriented traditions. Shivaism is the second largest denomination within Hinduism, around uh, 252 million followers or 26% of all Hindus identify themselves as Shivaism. Uh, Shivaya's traditions about Shiva are very complex because Shiva is a very complex deity. I actually have two images of, of, of Shiva here uh, and because Shiva has multiple aspects. He is both destructive as well as creative, both menacing as well as uh, benign, sensual as well as aesthetic, and, and Shiva is also male and female. Shiva is all and is in all. Um, the term destroyer is not really the right term here. It often gets described that way, but it's not the right term here. In truth, the right term is Shiva the transformer. But in order to, to transform things, you do need to destroy. So that's why it's known sometimes Shiva as the destroyer, but in truth, Shiva is the transformer. Shiva is often depicted as the Lord of dance or the Lord of yoga. So in these two images here, the one at the bottom 
le uh, the bottom left image of the dancing lord of Shiva, and the top right is Shiva as well. But you can't see the whole picture, but Shiva is meditating in a, in a yoga stance as well. Um, and it speaks to its complex nature. The dancing lord, um, Nataraha, Nataraha, as it's known in Hinduism, uh, Shiva's cosmic dance sets the world in motion. So you can see here that why it's always in a circle here, that the rhythm of the world is samsara, life, death, rebirth. And it's Shiva who sets the world in motion and the universe in motion through dance, which is very interesting. Um, and the Lord of Yoga, Shiva, is the, is, is the prime Atman of the universe and is depicted as this omniscient yogi guru master who lives an ascetic life and who is the supreme guru for which all wisdom comes from. Shiva, I didn't have an image here, but Shiva is also, also depicted in a more ancient way known as the Ligam. The ligam is composed of two things, the linga and the yoni, which are abstract representations of Shiva and symbolize the merging of primordial matter with pure consciousness, creation. So it's a, it's, it's a uh, best way to describe it is a circle with a phallic-like sh like symbol, symbol coming up from it. Or statue, so it's a circle that has a phallic-like statue coming up in the middle of it, and it also, because of that, it symbolizes the sexual union between male and female energies as well. Um, traditional linga rituals include uh, providing, you know, uh, decorating it with flour or dried rice or fruits. Um, pouring water or milk over to bathe it. And so many of the customs of the linga actually predates the Vedas. And many people believe that the, the lingam is actually a leftover from the IVC community and civilization. So those are the Trigmarti of, of Hinduism. Uh, let's talk about the girls, the Tridiva. So again, not all Hindus exclusively worship or devoted to the male de deities. Many Hindus are also exclusively devoted to the female de deities, which is known as a denomination within Hinduism called Shaktiism. Shaktiism. And what is Shaktiism? Shaktiism is this in in emphasis that intense, intense love of the deity is more important than simple obedience or um, and it rejects the masculine feminine dichotomy of things that there is no male and female that there's a compilation of them both there is this male feminism that is together of what it believes that the universe is this this merging together of male and femaleness so if that kind of makes sense it's kind of hard to describe what it is um, <clears throat> so the, the Tridevies represent kind of the counterparts, well, not the counterparts, um, that's not the right term, um, not the counterparts, but they, the compliments, they're compliments to the Trimurti, that's the better word here than, than counterparts, I need to change that. They represent the compliments to the Trimurti, because they are known as the triple goddesses and are referred to as the principal deities of Hinduism, um, triple goddesses. And they're also um, married. They're the consorts of the three gods ahead of Brahma, Vishnu, and um, Shiva, respectively. So let's talk about the three here. So Sarwat, uh, uh, Sarawati, Sarawati is the goddess of law, of knowledge, art, music, wisdom. And as you can see here on the left, she's often depicted playing a, min, a musical instrument known as a vinia, and is always sitting on a lotus flower. Uh, she is the consort of Brahma, 
and is generally shown as having four arms, one holding a book, one holding rosaries that are used in prayers, one holding a water pot, and always holding a mis mis musical instrument. The book symbolizes the Vedas uh, uh, and the, uh, um, the water pot represents purity. Uh, the, the beads represent meditation. And of course, the musical instrument represents um, the arts as well as science, interesting enough. That um, science, the arts create harmony like music. So it's interesting how Hindus see the role of art. Uh, she's also always accompanied by a swan or a goose known as a, a hamsa and is often shown near her feet, symbolizing the ability to distinguish between good and evil um, as well. So she's a very interesting person. Um, the next one is Lakshmi. Lakshmi is the goddess of wealth and fortune and prosperity. She's the one on the far right. She is both the consort to, as well as the divine energy of the Hindu god Vishnu. And she assists Vishnu in creation of the world as well as protecting it and transforming it. So therefore, the relationship of Vishnu and Lakshmi are seen as a paradigm for the Hindu family as well as the role of the husband and the wife. So they're very important. Lakshmi is always depicted in Indian art as very elegantly dressed. Uh, she's shown uh, showering, um, pouring out money, as you can see there, because of her sense of prosperity. Um, and, but also, too, she's always holding a lotus flower, symbolizing the uh, knowledge and spiritual liberation. Uh, again, depicted sharing out, sh uh, pouring out gold as her symbolness, as a symbol to uh, provide prosperity to anyone that seeks it. The last one, oh, I forgot to mention Lakshmi there. The last one is Parvati. Parvati is one of the principal goddesses of Hinduism and uh, sometimes seen as the mother goddess. So you can see her image in the middle there, the mother goddess. And she is the power of, of uh, uh, of, of energy, of motherhood, of nourishment, of harmony, of love, of beauty, of devotion. She really represents the divine mother in the sense, and she is the consort of Shiva. And she is the mother of another god that we'll talk about here later, Ganesha. And so you can see the image of Ganesha there um, um, at on her lap. Um, Pavarti is often depicted as a beautiful woman with fair skin, always dressed in red, sometimes dressed in green, but normally red, and wearing lots and lots of jewelry. Uh, she's usually depicted uh, 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 with Shiva, uh, and sometimes she appears with two arms, which you can see here. Uh, but when she's alone by herself, She's always depicted with four arms, like everybody else. But if she's with somebody else, like here in this image, she's she's on, she's riding a, a lion. She's always depicted with two arms. So it's very interesting of why that difference is here. The last thing, and I just want to cover this quickly, is because there are other deities that are very important as well within Hindu culture. Uh, and so the uh, the gods that I want to mention are Kali. Kali, um, sometimes known as uh, Druga, Druga, are manifestations of Parvati as well. Um, but they're treated as different. And so that's why I want to bring them as different. It, this is Parvati. Kali is Parvati. But in some areas of India, Kali is depicted as something completely different. So that's why I want to treat Kali as being different. Kali is the goddess of death and time and change, and she's often depicted as a very fierce warrior, a demonic looking warrior. So you can see her picture there on the far right. She looks pretty badass right there. 
and she has the, the severed head of one of her victims. Uh, Kali is often depicted in blue or black skin with red eyes and a sword always in hand covered in blood sometimes. Uh, and that's her enemy, her arch enemy of the demon god, uh, Rakta Bija. And sometimes you have her drinking the drinking blood of her victim as well. Uh, fang teeth, having a garland of skulls around her neck. Um, uh, and what's always interesting, she's standing on the body of her husband, Shiva. So it's very interesting. It's a very powerful symbol of womanhood in Indian culture. And so uh, she does kind of represent that as well. A very powerful symbol of womanhood. And so why she's often um, revered in Hindu society, because she's seen as the ultimate female. That if, uh, and, if, and she presents a different presentation of the female, not as the loving, devoted uh, wife, but as a fearsome man, almost. Just as equivalent to a man. But even better, because look at her husband. <laughs> he's alive, but he's, he's, all, she's, he's always depicted as underneath her feet. Kali is the ultimate badass, if you will. Uh, she destroys, utterly destroys evil in order to protect the ones that she loves. So that's why Shiva is put under her foot there is because it's a sign of protection. <laughs> but it doesn't translate that way often. Uh, Durga. Durga. I don't have an image of Durga here, but Durga is the uh, a goddess of strength and protection. And she's often depicted riding a tiger. So you see the tiger image there, uh, Pravarti, uh, so that you have those images as well. So I don't want to do much in there, but she's very similar to Kali. Um, she combats evil, demonic forces, riding her tiger in the battle, things like that. Um, the last one is probably the most famous one is Ganesha. Um, Ganesha. And Ganesha is the god of new beginnings and the god of luck, as well as the remover of obstacles. Ganesha, Ganesha is often evoked by Hindus today. Um, as uh, when they're starting a new business or if they're signing a, a new contract or if they're starting a relationship or they're starting to travel somewhere, it's always Ganesha that's evoked in prayer. So really in modern Hinduism, Ganesha is becoming more and more popular um, because of the ever-changing world. Um, and regardless of whoever's denomination, if you're Shiva, you know, exclusive worship of Shiva or Vishnu or exclusive worship of Kali, they also pray to Ganesha. So Ganesha is very popular. Ganesha is the son of Shiva and Parvati and is readily identifiable because of the elephant head. And the reason that Ganesha has an elephant head and versus a human head is that the story goes that um, Shiva accidentally decapitated her son's head due to jealousy that he saw her son with his with his wife that his wife had just given birth to her to his son but his son was fully grown when she gave birth to him so seeing his wife you know with her with her, her her dress up and you know and just giving birth and you know everything showing there he thinks that they're not just giving birth but they just had sex so he accidentally kills his own son by decapitates him but then once they realize what has happened. Pravarta is able to resurrect her dead son by using the head of an elephant. So that's why they have the elephant head. Um, and so this ends our lecture on Hinduism.